czy takie zgromadzenia mogą działać w społeczeństwach głęboko podzielonych, a następnie zaproszę Państwa do dyskusji. Ale zacznijmy od tego, że musimy rozmawiać. Musimy rozmawiać to nazwa projektu bardzo nowego, który zakończył się dopiero w ubiegłym tygodniu w Belgii. To zdjęcie zrobiono w federalnym parlamencie Belgii w Brukseli. Cztery osoby siedzące z przodu nie są politykami, nie są członkami parlamentu. Są to zwykli obywatele, którzy zostali losowo wybrani, aby przez kilka weekendów omawiać przyszłość finansowania partii w Belgii. Partie polityczne otrzymują w Belgii bardzo wiele pieniędzy i codziennie obywatele starają się znaleźć rozwiązanie. Jest to Komisja Konstytucyjna Parlamentu Federalnego, a y, musimy rozmawiać. To inicjatywa oddalna, oddolna zorganizowana przez pięć think tanków i mój think tank G1000, to jak G27 czy G7, nie jesteśmy wybierani, ale mamy swoją moc. I w ramach tego projektu wybiera się 60 osób losowo, które odzwierciedlają zróżnicowanie kraju i przez trzy weekendy wysłuchują oni eksperckich porad naukowców. Zaprosiliśmy do udziału wszystkie partie polityczne, nawet radykalną prawicę, nawet ekstremistyczną prawicę i 10 z 12 pojawiło się, 10 z 12 partii przysłało swojego lidera, aby rozmawiał z obywatelami o przyszłości. To jest zdjęcie zrobione w drugi weekend. Mamy 60 uczestników, a tych 10 osób z przodu to są właśnie prezesi poszczególnych partii. Są znacznie mniej uśmiechnięci, ale bardzo ważne jest to, że przyjechali, aby rozmawiać o przyszłości finansowania swoich partii. Jest to niezwykle ważne dla nawiązania ponownego kontaktu pomiędzy politykami. And even the two political parties who didn't like the idea of a citizens' assembly, who refused to come, asked constructive questions. And we keep them in the loop. It's very important to have this fundamentally pluralist attitude. Um, ministers have contacted us. Even yesterday, a Flemish minister asked us, please, can you come? Because I'm, as a minister of the interior in Flanders, I have to talk about party financing in election in, at the local level. So we want to learn from you. Party leaders are going to be visited. I think we might be seeing the emergence of a new bill on party funding, which will contain a number of elements coming out of the Citizens' Assembly. And the most important thing is that already now, a new dialogue between citizens and politicians has been established. Now, don't get me wrong, Belgium is not a democratic Walhalla. This is not Nirvana either. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, the OECD published a list with countries and the level of trust in government. This is where Belgium is, and look at our neighbor. I mean, <laughs> folks, we're in this together, right? It's not just you, it's not just us, it's, it's us together. Um, and so this brings me to a, a wider topic, apart from we need to talk, which is the topic of the global crisis of democracy. This is not just a Belgian problem, this is not just a Polish problem. Unfortunately, it's a much wider issue. And The Economist, just a year ago, published its annual uh, report on state of democracy in the world, and saying it, that again we are seeing a new law for global democracy. Freedom House, a British organization, which is publishing every year a report on freedom in the world, was warning of the global expansion of authoritarian rule. And in practice, they have been doing this for a number of years, 15 years to say the least, 16 years. This is from 2005 to 2021. The number of countries that have been improving over the previous year and the number of democracies that have been worrying and worsening. This is a frightening development. If less and less countries are improving and more and more are stepping back, we are losing freedom. And effectively, this is how they calculated it. Between 2005 and 2021, 
the number of people living in free nations has diminished dramatically from 46% in 2005 to just above 20% in a few years ago. So we see the rise of authoritarian regimes, of autocratic regimes, and we see we're losing freedom, we're losing democracy. Just um, about two months ago, Joe Biden organized the second summit for democracy, and this is what he had to say. Democracy had declined by some measures for 15 consecutive years. Clearly, he had read the report from Freedom House. We are at an inflection point in history here, where the decisions we make today are going to affect the course of our world for the next several decades, for certain. I think Biden is absolutely right here. And I think he's absolutely right to realize that this is more than an American problem. This is more than a problem with the Republican Party. This is more than the problem with Trump. This is a democracy that a lot of advanced, this is a problem that a lot of advanced democracies in the world are facing right now. We're in a serious position. So one element of the solution might be the use of citizens' assemblies. The way we do democracy, mainly through elections, through party politics, through representative bodies, has not been changing dramatically over the past 200 years. In the 21st century, we are still doing democracy the way it was conceived in the 18th century. Everything has changed. Everything has been innovated. Science, culture, sports, technology, industry, economy. But the way we do democracy, the procedures we use for doing democracy are still the same from the mid 18th century. And we believe now that voting is so important that if you say democracy, you mean elections. For the past 200 years, indeed, we have been doing democracy through elections. But for the past 25 centuries, elections were hardly ever in use. So the idea that democracy comes down to the sole and single principle of using elections is highly challenged. And this is where citizens' assemblies come in interestingly. Now, a citizens' assembly, in its briefest definition, is a random selection of citizens brought together to consider a policy issue. Like those brave 60 Belgians who came together during three weekends to talk about party financing in Belgium. And the key elements there is that you use a representative cross-section of society which you create through lottery, through sortition, so that everybody has the same chance to participate. You work with public deliberation. It's not just bringing people together and they can shout whatever they want. It's deliberation with a clear question and a clear mandate. There is time to learn, to talk, to decide. And afterwards, there is a transmission of recommendations and follow-up by political authorities. This model is not an alternative to elections. This is not an argument to forget about elections altogether. This is an argument to combine the two, to combine election plus sortition. Citizens' assemblies help our leaders to lead. Now, why is lottery so important? Because if you don't do lottery, this is what you get. This is classical participatory democracy where you have participants, citizens, who feel very strongly about a given topic, mostly in negative ways, and you have the poor politician on the left who is there trying to rescue his evening. This is classical participatory democracy without lottery. What I'm defending is the use of lottery to turn participatory democracy into deliberative democracy. Not just people who have strong feelings, not just citizens who are strongly politicized, but everyday citizens who may or may not have prior opinions on given topics. How does it work in practice? Um, typically, you would use a two-step process. You start with a random sample. For instance, if you want to run a panel with 150 participants, you would send out letters of invitation to 10,000 random addresses, and you will get about 1,000 to 1,500 positive replies. But you will see that in these positive replies, typically you'll have more men than women, more people with college degrees than people without college degrees, more people above the age of 50 than below the age of 50, and more people, more white people than people of color than migrants. So this is, there's, there's a bias problem there. 
And to correct that bias problem, you go to the second step, where you randomly select 150, your final number, from the people who said yes. And this is where you weigh for age, gender, region, socioeconomic, level of education, etc., etc. And the result, the result is a sample which can be representative of the overall population. And just before entering this room, I was handed over this report on a Polish panel, the conclusions of the nationwide citizens' assembly on energy costs. I think people did a terrific job here. I didn't know about the process, but I'm really impressed to see by what people have been doing. They didn't do it through letters, but by phone calls, which is interesting. It was a lot of phone calls, but they were successful in bringing together a random sample representative of the diversity of Polish society. I just mentioned that this, this is not a new thing. This is not democratic innovation. It's democratic re-innovation. This was done centuries ago. This is what Aristotle had to say. It's accepted as democratic when public offices are allocated by lot and as oligarchic when they are filled by election. As a matter of fact, the word election and the word elite have the same etymological root. It is those who have been picked out, uh, have been elected to represent the others the best that have been represented to represent the others. And the Greeks had their machine for doing lottery. This was called the Cleroterion. This was used in the fifth and fourth centuries BC. Um, people had to put their name tag in and they were drafted by lot to see whether they're going to serve publicly in Greek. Uh, this is what you ended up with. 19th century reconstructions of ancient Athens are always slightly hilarious, but this is what it looked like. Unfortunately, citizenship then was reduced to free male with a certain uh, level of, of, of wealth, which is obviously a problem. But the very principle of using lottery to create a representation of the society was an interesting one. One person has been instrumental in reminding us of that work, and it's Hannah Arendt, when she said in the 70s, representative government is in crisis today partly because it has lost in the course of time all institutions that permitted the citizens' actual participation, and partly because it is now gravely affected by the disease from which the party system suffers, bureaucratization, and the two parties' tendency to represent nobody except the party machines. Incredible statement, 50 years old, highly relevant for today, highly appreciative of what the old Greeks ancient Greeks used to do. This thinking on deliberative democracy with everyday citizens has been furthered by thinkers like Jürgen Habermas in Germany and John Rawls in the US, believing that democracy should be more deliberative. deliberative. It's more than just about voting, it's about talking. And it's not just about thinking, because these ideas have been put to practice in Germany a very unknown figure, Peter Dino, he is the true pioneer. In 71, organized the first Planungszellen, planification cells. Peter Dino is the man standing on the right. He's a sociologist and theologian. And he said, like, everyday people should have a chance to speak out on the future of their mu municipalities. At the same time, in the US, Ned Crosby was launching the citizens' jury process independently from what was happening in Germany. I had the chance to meet Ned Cross shortly before his death, uh, just two years ago. Wonderful man who did some truly pioneering work publishing pieces like this on the educated random sample. Wonderful, uh, a pilot study on a new way to get citizen input into the policy making pro 50 years ago. Wonderful. Today we see that this educated random sample, this has been getting traction. The OECD has been building a database of citizens' assemblies across the world since the 1990s, and we see a wave, an acceleration from 2010 onwards. But this wave is not equal over countries. If we look at countries who have been active, Germany, Australia, Canada, Denmark, they have a long tradition there. Ireland joined the ranks, but we're neighbors again. Poland and Belgium. A few years ago, we were at the trailing end of this development. The Irish Citizens' Assembly, and I'm very glad that Sarah is here. She's going to be talking about this absolutely pioneering work with the Citizens' Assembly on a number of topics. 
Germany is going very fast now. This was a few years ago in Berlin. Now it's the uh, Bundestag itself, the German federal parliament organizing citizens' assemblies. Macron organizing a citizens' convention on the climate and recently one on euthanasia. And the European Union, the Conference on the Future of Europe, bringing together a random sample of Europeans. The main conclusion is, is that when people get the authority, the time, information, everyday people take tough questions, they are successfully sidestepping party lines and deliver sensible answers. Um, so another democracy is possible. The question is, can this work in deeply divided societies? Can this work in a country like the US, for instance, where you know, polarization has become extreme? Now, a book was published about this, Democratic Deliberation in Deeply Divided Societies, a couple of years ago. The conclusion was that citizens' assemblies can be and have been successfully used in divided societies, often across ethnic, religious or linguistic lines, sometimes even after violent conflict. There are a number of cases of using citizens' assemblies to bring everyday people together after war because quite simply, most everyday citizens want solutions. And it is perhaps when the situation is most difficult that it is most needed to sit together. We need to talk is what you need to do after we had to fight. Examples come from Colombia, after the war between the government and the FARC, after the ceasefire, a number of citizens' assemblies took place. It wasn't easy, but it was important. In Northern Ireland, a number of citizens' assemblies have taken place, notably in Omar, the city that had been devastated by the worst attack by the IRA. It has also been done recently in the city of Mostar in Bosnia, a city that didn't have elections between 2008 and 2020. Political stalemate for 12 years. And at that point, everyday citizens came together to talk on topics that were important to the city of Mostar. And the first topic they picked for deliberation was dirt, cleanliness of the city. An everyday topic, which was not something that was ethnically divisive. And people su successfully came together to formulate recommendations. I think it's an incredible example. And they're continuing to do this. And on the bu building on the success of, of Mostar in Bosnia, the country itself, Bosnia and Herzegovina, has recently done a citizens' assembly on the most ethnically divisive topic, voting rights, and how do we organize our parliament, how do we organize our presidency. They have three presidents. There is ethnic division, but it's mostly elite separatism. It's elite polarization. On the basis, polarization can take very different forms. Yes, elites can you know, trickle down polarizing discourses. That's absolutely true. But citizens' assemblies are quite good at going beyond the polarization by letting everyday people talk. It also works in linguistically divided countries, like my own country, Belgium. We have three official languages. This is the citizen summit that I organized uh, more than 10 years ago now. This started on my kitchen table, but my kitchen was too small. Um, the G1000 was like the moment when we were without the government for a year and a half because political elites said like, well, Flemish speakers and French speakers, we don't get along. Here you have Flemish speakers and French speakers getting along very well. And over the years, my country has become a bit of a pioneer on democratic innovation with lots of local, regional, and now recently even federal processes. Uh, a few months ago, the first bill on sortition, on random sampling for deliberative assemblies was voted in the federal parliament, making sure that the national register could be used for creating random samples. It's an important step. Belgium also became the first country that had a permanent climate assembly. This was voted half a year ago in the city of Brussels. And also the country with the first permanent citizens assembly not just on one topic, not just for a few weeks, but ongoing and institutionalized. I'm going to finish there very quickly. This is the famous Oost Belgian model in the eastern part, which is the red part over there, close to the German border. The East Belgian model was set up by the minister president who said like, 
We are the smallest entity, let us become the laboratory for democratic innovation. It was conceived by 14 experts. You might recognize Marcin Gerwin, the Polish expert on the left-hand side. The bill was voted unanimously, and it brings together the classical model of doing democracy with citizens voting for a parliament, creating a government, with a double form of, I'm just going to go do, do this quickly, it's a, it's a combining a citizen council with citizens panel. The citizen council is drafted by lot for a year and a half. The citizens panel sit for three to five months each. And this long lottery combined with the short lottery makes sure that more and more people get involved and that their recommendations get traction in politics. A lot of international attention in The Economist called it a Belgian experiment that Aristotle would have approved of. The Spiegel wrote about it, Le Point, Politico, even a Polish website mentioned the Ost-Belgian model, Spanish website, the OECD calling it the gold standard for democratic deliberation. And recently it has been copied by the city of Paris based on the Ost-Belgian model. So the question is, and now, how can we learn from here? How can we move from here? Yes, another democracy is possible. And I think it's important that democracy will renew itself or it will disappear. It's more than just about elections. Next to the right to vote, citizens should have the right to speak as well. And this transition, in order to be successful, requires a concerted effort from academics, activists, journalists, and politicians Deep pluralism is key here. And the question with which I want to end my presentation is, what are the necessary conditions for this to work in Poland as well? And we're very much looking forward to hear from the people who organize this. I thank you very much. very much for this riveting presentation. Uh, uh, we appreciate it, though I must warn everybody that we are running uh, about half an hour late. We are, running, we are on the Polish time, not on the Norwegian time. You see, this is the problem. And the Polish time is being like 200 years late, okay? Uh, so, so this, <laughs> this is the, the, the problem we are facing, but I hope that we will manage to uh, slice a bit of time for the questions from the audience which will be, please note them down, they will be uh, summed up at the end and there will be joint uh, uh, question here, uh, question and answer. Now, what I think you should know is that one of the favorite uh, humanists in the world, namely uh, the polar explorer uh, Friedrich Nansen, a Norwegian, said once that what is difficult we do immediately, what is impossible takes a bit longer. And uh, this is a wonderful motto, and here we have with us a woman who did almost the impossible, Sarah Monaghan, who assured the right uh, to abortion to the Irish women. Tell us how you did it. Thank you, Nina. Hello everyone, how are you? Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here this morning for such an important series of conversations. I look forward to sharing with all of you what I have learned about civil society change and campaigning and about mobilization of ordinary citizens to strengthen the democratic process. I also look forward very much to learning from you and David, thank you very much, that was fascinating. These fora for shared learnings and shared challenges and shared hopes are certainly more important now uh, than ever as we face democracy and civil rights being threatened here and all over the world. Um, so my name is Sarah Monaghan, um, I'm from Ireland and I have worked on civil society campaigns for change for the last 10 years. Um, this photo is of myself and my formidable uh, colleague, sorry, thank you, I'm too short <laughs> for it. <laughs> Perfect, is that better? 
All right, so this photo is of myself and my, my formidable colleague, Gráinne Griffin, and it is taken at Dublin Castle on uh, the day that we legalised abortion through a public vote in 2018. And I will speak primarily about this multi-year civil society campaign today. But just before I do, um, I wanted to touch on some of my other relevant work in social change campaigns. So I worked on the re-election of our current president, Michael D. Higgins, which was my absolute pleasure. Our president is somewhat well known uh, for his lyrical poetic ability and also for his deep commitment to democracy and to human rights, to workers' rights and to the trade union movement. Currently, I work for the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, which is Ireland's oldest and largest rape crisis centre. And there I have led the development of the We Consent campaign, which is a national campaign to change the culture, to change society, to change public understanding and awareness of the importance issue of sexual consent. This campaign is all about cultural change. It is not about um, political or, or legal change. It is about the change that is made by people on the ground in their everyday individual and collective actions and, and beliefs. I suppose, as we all know, a change in the law does not necessarily change society. It does not necessarily change practice or beliefs or bias. And while law is integral, societal change is just as important, if not perhaps more so. So, on May 25th, 2018, 66.4% of the Irish population voted yes. They voted yes to repealing the 8th. They voted yes to legalising abortion. Yes to choice and to supporting and respecting women. But for 35 years, women and, and, and others in Ireland have been fighting for that yes. And so I'd like to begin today by just quickly taking you through some of the history of that yes and the many ways in which civil society and the democratic process shaped that yes. So in another referendum in 1983, the public voted to insert the Eighth Amendment into our constitution. Simply put, this law equated the right to life of the unborn with the right to life of the mother, ensuring that whatever the circumstances, abortion was illegal. In 1992, another popular vote, the 12th Amendment, granted women the right to travel to another jurisdiction to access abortion. So in a wildly hypocritical vote, we acknowledged the reality and the prevalence of abortion, but decided we were happier to export it elsewhere. And so, forcing women to travel en masse to other countries, particularly the UK. But not everyone could travel. For those who could not, they were left with very limited options. They could import safe but illegal abortion pills, often taking them at home, alone, without any kind of medical supervision. Or worse, they could self-harm in an attempt to induce a miscarriage. Every year in Ireland, women presented in hospitals having used coat hangers, knitting needles, imbibing toxic liquids, or throwing themselves downstairs to end their pregnancies. This is not a throwback to some distant past. This was very much a reality for those who could not afford pills or could not afford travel in Western Ireland in the 21st century in my lifetime. And I want to acknowledge, and I'm heartbroken in the knowledge that as I speak now, this is yet again the reality for women in Poland. Heartbroken this week to, to, to learn of yet another woman who had died prematurely and unnecessarily under Poland's abortion law. She was 33 years old and her name was Dorotha. This is also yet again the reality for women across the United States, in Malta, in the Philippines, across parts of Africa, across parts of South America, and so the list goes on. And much like here in Poland, every one of us in Ireland knew of someone who had been in a situation where they needed a, a medical care which they could not access. But it was one woman's case that struck a chord in the public conversation like none other before it. A young woman, Savita Halapanavar, moved to Ireland from India, about to start a family with her husband, where she began to miscarry at 17 weeks. She then died of septicemia, having been refused her request for the abortion that would have saved her life, as doctors delayed as they waited for the fetal heartbeat to stop first. In her dying days, she was told by a nurse that she couldn't receive a termination because this Ireland was a Catholic country. The abortion rights campaign, or, or ARC as, as I might refer to it as, was established in 2012. It was a few months prior to Savita's death where a small group of women and men gathered together in a room, united in the belief that the Irish law and the society which it reflected had to change. Since this element of our healthcare was enshrined in the constitution, it required a referendum. 
In 2012, we knew that this was many years away still. There was not yet a public appetite, and consequently, there was not a political appetite. In a democracy, politicians and legislators will only go where they are brought, they will only go where they are led, sometimes they will only go where they are pushed. And so our strategy from the beginning was to push up from the ground through grassroots organising. So the abortion rights campaign is a grassroots, all volunteer, non-hierarchical, all island, non-politically affiliated campaign. So it's quite the mouthful. <laughs> so what does it mean? It means that from day one, we were the people and we represented the people. We were not the elite, as David mentioned, we were not elected officials or politically influenced in our decision making. None of us earned a wage from our work and yet, night after night, over six years, our small office, and I emphasize the small, filled with people all working on different projects and on different aspects of the same overall goal. Free, safe, legal. Abortion access for all, not for the few. In 2016, as David also mentioned, a citizens' assembly was appointed in Ireland to consider reform of our abortion laws. This was Ireland's second citizens' assembly process. Our first was regarding same-sex marriage and came, I think, in 2014, 2013. The citizens' assembly in Ireland brings together 99 randomly selected members of the public to discuss and debate a specific issue. So people from all walks of life who are not normally involved in policy development or in legislative proposals and matters are brought together to deliberate and exchange views on a specific topic. Members of the Assembly are then asked to carefully consider a range of views, expert opinion, reports, studies, um, information from, from other countries, and this allows them to have an make an informed assessment uh, on all perspectives of a topic. From this, the Assembly culminates in a series of recommendations in the form of a report, and this is given to government um, and into our Houses of Parliament. Now, I would be lying if I said that civil society organisations in Ireland welcomed this at the time. Our fear was that this would produce yet another report which would sit on a shelf and, and, and gather dust unimplemented. We also feared, if I'm honest, that 99 people would not possibly be able to understand, would not assess the facts and, and come to the opinion and see the very real damage that was being done in, in real life every day. However, on the day that the Citizens' Assembly released their statement which strongly called for a referendum to legalise abortion, we, we, we ate our words and we quickly praised citizens' assemblies as the best democratic mechanism we had ever seen and that's the public story that <laughs> we stick to. And it was an important lesson for us in trust. We slowly began to move from a group forever feeling at odds with public opinion to realising that maybe we could dare to trust in these types of democratic processes. We could dare to trust in people around us. We could dare to hope. These things, of course, though, are always easier in hindsight. During these years of the citizens' assemblies, we were organising, we were building support on the ground. We knew that we needed to support a community of budding activists across Ireland in order to build the infrastructure of local groups that would be key in both securing a referendum and later winning a referendum. Now, for, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to speak about these groups at length now, but I'm very happy to answer any questions in the discussion. Um, because their impact in winning a national campaign was um, quite prolific. So I'll fast forward a little bit. In 2018, January, ARC, the abortion rights campaign, began laying the foundations for Together for Yes. Together for Yes was the national civil society campaign to remove the Eighth Amendment from our constitution. Now, as I mentioned earlier, and hopefully you are aware, the Together for Yes campaign was successful, and in May of that year, Irish people overwhelmingly voted yes to change the constitution and legalise abortion. And so uh, here are several of the key lessons that we learned during and, and throughout that campaign. So the first learning is integral in being able and equipped to work together. Together for Yes brought together a very broad and disparate coalition of groups who are all committed to legalising abortion in Ireland. And this broad and very disparate coalition was fundamental to our success as it meant that each group from within that overarching umbrella could speak to a different cohort of the population. We all know that we cannot be all things to all people, and so no one person can connect with every member of the general public. It's quite a, a tall ask. Bringing together, though, such a disparate group of organisations and individuals, it is challenging, of course. And so trust and compromise are everything. 
trusting in each other's good intentions, trusting that the people alongside you are committed to the end goal, that shared goal, suspending your differences in as much as is possible until you have achieved that shared goal. Now, this may seem incredibly basic, but it is often the hardest part and it is often where civil society campaigns fall down. In Ireland, the pro-life campaign on the, on the other side were unable to do this. Their coalition also involved a very broad church of groups, some more vehemently uh, right-wing and extreme than others. And in the end, their infighting damaged their ability to put forward a united front so badly that the public could not engage. Going for goals. So the abortion rights campaign since its formation in 2012 called for free, safe, legal access to abortion. No restrictions, no cutoffs, no conditions to care. Now to some, this may look naive and unrealistic, but this was actually extremely strategic and purposeful. Anyone who works with government in any country, in any capacity, will know that you will be negotiated downwards on whatever you ask for. I am yet to be in the position, perhaps one day I will, when I go into a government department and ask for legal change and I'm told, actually, you can have more legal change than you asked for. So when you ask for gold, you will get silver. If you ask for silver, you will get bronze. And if you ask for bronze, which is often what seems like the most realistic and, and, and acceptable thing to do, you may leave with next to nothing. So we always fought for gold and we got silver. And now we continue to fight for better access for women because as we also all know, social change does not end. It is not one day achieved and then cemented forever. We all know that, look now to Roe v. Wade, a uh, post Roe v. Wade, I should say, America. The fight will always continue, so do not be discouraged with silver because it gives you a firm, strong base to work from. For any large scale of change to happen, it requires a strong infrastructure beneath it. It, it is rare and, and I would argue impossible for one person or even a number of senior people on their own to make change at this level happen. Because for change to really work and for it to be lasting change, it needs to infiltrate and cement itself in people's lives. It needs to go down into the roots. And generally this is done through civil society organizations supporting people on the ground to establish local groups, local cells, local factions, comprised of local people promoting the message. A message that is communicated between friends, between family, between members, is, is far more powerful than a message communicated by me or anyone else on the radio. So this model is very typical in political campaigning, training people up to knock on doors. But what we did was deeper than that. We gave people ownership. Yes, we trained and we delivered workshops and we provided resources and badges and leaflets and materials and money. But most importantly, we instilled in them the belief that this belonged to them. This referendum was theirs to win and that their action on the ground in their local community, it could be the action that seals the deal. It could be the one vote that matters. Operate, operating like this comes back to trust and compromise because it may mean that people use language or a message that is not exactly what you'd like it to be. <laughs> it may mean that they take an approach that isn't exactly how you would do it or like them to do it. But if you tighten the reins too much, you will smother that fire and that passion that comes from real mobilization. And it is that fire that means teams will commit everything that they have to winning and cementing social change. You cannot win without that fire. In a democracy, politicians can feel that fire. They will eventually follow that because each of those people so passionate and, and committed represent the votes which will elect them in the next election. Meet people where they are. So this is the fundamentals of campaigning and one of the most important jobs you will ever do in any campaign is to establish where the population and where different cohorts within the population are at in relation to an issue. Determining what people currently think and know and understand and believe and feel is the first step. And this can be done through research or consultation, focus groups on the street, really gathering as much info as you can, not just about what people think, but why they think it. This is your base to work from. Your base should not be what you and your colleagues think and know and feel. That part is the destination. The other is the starting point. It is not the general public's job to care about a social issue like we do. And no matter how much we might wish that everyone knows what we do and thinks the way that we do, that they don't. And accepting their starting point is crucial. Otherwise, you will develop a campaign and a language and a message that appeals very much to you and people like you people who are already inside that bubble, 
but never comes close to reaching the people who you actually want to and need to speak to. For instance, during our Repeal the Eighth campaign, we initially relied very heavily on rights-based language, my body, my choice. However, research told us that the public didn't connect with this. They didn't think it was for them, about them. What they really connected with was talking about abortion in terms of healthcare. And in particular, they wanted to hear from doctors as the expert medical opinion. Now, again, I'll be honest, as feminists, we didn't always love this. They didn't really want to hear from women as the lived experts, they wanted to hear from, from doctors. But we had to work with the reality that was in front of us. Knowing versus caring, and really here it's a combination of both. Any social change campaign needs to not only be about examining and developing what we know and understand, so that might be definitions, facts, statistics, shared language, but in addition it really needs to focus on how people value an issue, if, if at all. Because you can know and intellectually understand everything about something and not actually care about it. And it is the care part that will motivate your behaviour. Knowledge is not enough to change behaviour. If it was, we'd live in a different world. You know, knowledge is important, that's a given. People need to understand and be given the route to understand. But they also have to value it in order to want to integrate it into their lives and make changes. And this very often comes down to how they feel it impacts them personally or impacts someone that they love and care about, or someone like them, someone that they can see themselves in. So making that connection for people is very important. Because when it, issues are too abstract, we tend to think, we tend to either not think about them, or we think, you know, that's terrible, but it's nothing to do with me, and then we have a problem. A good strategy for this is often to use stories. Stories are one of the best ways to bring an issue into your home and into your heart. I am a big believer that no matter how logical and fact-driven we think we are, it is always the heart that leads first. The heart hooks you in, and then the head catches up and will look for more evidence to back that up. You know, it is the striking photo, or it is the story, or it is the video that, that, that hooks you in because it pulls on your heart. That is what brings people in far more effectively than a list of statistics. During our repeal campaign, women's stories and experiences were essential connect to connecting people to the movement. We centred those stories in our strategy. It was real people telling real stories about the reality of their lives. It meant that people could see themselves in the issue. They could read a story or, or hear on the radio and think, oh, that could be me, or that could be my sister, that could be my daughter, that could be someone I care about. Suddenly it wasn't an abstract problem out here anymore. It was a problem that was knocking on their door. And women across Ireland told their story, and at great personal cost, bearing their souls. And some did so publicly, and some did so around a kitchen table, telling a family member that, yes, they had travelled to England, and yes, actually, you do know someone who has had an abortion. And on vote day, our polling station was full of people who cast a yes vote for one of those stories. Which brings me to my close. Social change is hard. It is slow, it can be dangerous, it can bring you to your knees. And because of that, it is so important to celebrate the wins, even when there is still so much to do. Last week we marked five years since the repeal of the Eighth Amendment and it is always a day of very mixed emotion. It is one of celebration as we change history that day, but it is also one where we continue to fight. Despite the removal of the Eighth Amendment in Ireland, we still have multiple unnecessary barriers to abortion care. Many women and pregnant people are still being forced to travel to access care, in particular in cases of fatal fetal anomaly. You know, abortion access has become somewhat of a postcode lottery where, where you live it really dictates whether you can access care or not. We have a mandatory three-day waiting period in order to let women really have a good think for themselves about whether they want to access care or not. And provision of abortion after 12 weeks is still a crime which has a very chilling effect on doctors and medical practitioners who try to play the game of being 100% accurate and sure about your due date. And so we keep fighting. We keep acknowledging the past, both the tragedy and the triumph. Thank you very much. I think Sarah was inspiring and also uh, she turned our attention to a very often neglected aspect of social transformations, namely changing narratives. 
or the power of narratives in bringing about social change, which is uh, extremely important. Now, our next speaker is very special to me because uh, he is uh, Jerry Lieberman, with whom I had the pleasure to collaborate uh, on the project devoted to this, what is the mystery of the success of Norway? The ambassador of Norway who is sitting here would be pleased to hear that I had an American collaborator <laughs> in this project and we decided all together that it's not just oil and gas, okay? So there are some human qualities that are uh, mobilized that we no know very little about. Jerry is uh, also a co-sponsor co of this uh, meeting, of this conversation, and uh, it's thanks to him and Jin, who is also working in Evolution Institute, that we are here and we can discuss uh, these international experiences. Jerry, you are leading an institute which is using the uh, biological or evolutionary science as a basis for uh, activism, which is a very unique uh, combination of fusion. Could you tell us about it? How do you do it? How, what are the ups and downs? I'm not sure if I'm Polish, Hungarian, or what it, all I know is that we're still researching that question from the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire. So I could be Polish, and I would be proud to be Polish big time. I'm so happy finally to be here. And I think this is a wonderful country which has been abused for a thousand years and has had little opportunity to really transform itself into a democracy. But I think people like you could bring that about. I, I just, if you find anything I say of interest, which may not be possible, because I'm from Brooklyn, my wife always reminds me he's from Brooklyn, so you have to forgive him, even though she's from her, uh, part of the country where the last seat of the Confederacy. So I like to go outside of my own ethnic group. I believe one way to, to practice what you say is to feel comfortable with people from very different backgrounds and even get married to them and spend your life with them. That's a good practical first step. Um, when I think about Darwin, I think about being careful not to turn people off. Because, you know, Hitler said Darwin was one of the greatest men that ever lived. Of course, I don't know if you ever read Darwin, but Darwin was not a social Darwinist. Darwin didn't believe in bad things. Darwin was afraid even to say he was a Darwinian because at the time, that wasn't a good thing to be saying anywhere in the world because we all came from uh, you know, a place where they had snakes and other kinds of things and apples that could seduce you. The, the reality of it is that we really haven't developed the science of evolution until the latter part of the 20th century. So what we find is that there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding on the part of academics and scholars who defended euthanasia and other things, believing that that was part of survival of the fittest. And so we can be having a PhD and doing dastardly things and working for authoritarian people, and that happens all the time. So there's nothing that gives us a special privilege being uh, academics if we don't really uh, have good values and we're not thinking in a really global sense. And that is very difficult to make that transition. So today, we can say that genes do not control our destiny, that our cultural factors have as much influence and even more expeditiously than our, the genes do not direct us to be bad people or good people. Under certain conditions, we could be good, and, a certain, and, and other conditions, selfish and rotten and miserable, and invade other countries because we have the military to do it. And my country has sometimes led the way in invading other countries in South America, Central America, and Asia, and other places. We're no angels. But I, what I think is important is that when we spend five years looking at what can be done to do things better, instead of uh, relying on our universities and all these different resources and colleges, we looked at an alternative called the think tank. And the think tank phenomena has exploded all over the world, not always for good reasons. So to create a think tank, 
that doesn't become a tool of capitalism or neoliberalism or you know, rich people determining how they want to spend their money for whatever reason. We looked at it from the standpoint of how to improve cooperation, pro-social behavior, how to be human beings without any ethnocentric tendency. And this is a real challenge. And I went all over looking for a place where we could bring our ideas, including the Brookings Institute and many other think tanks. And they said, we don't need that, we're already doing that, no thank you. And what we were talking about is something very different. We were talking about a think tank that was international in its perspective, respectful of the planet. We weren't thinking about money coming from certain donors who had a narrow agenda and were looking at it through the lens of Americans. We were looking at it from the lens of where are the best places in the world for children to grow up, for women to raise families. Does that sound familiar in Ireland? And we were really trying to do that across disciplines. Some people call it interdisciplinary, some people call it transdisciplinary. It's very difficult and I am an academic too, to actually sit down and work you know, with a biologist, to work with a chemist, to work with a, an astronomer, to work with a behavioral scientist. To do that is, and do it across cultures is extremely challenging. So what we decided to do was do a new thing, and that is say human beings have the capacity based on good conditions to create a society like Norway. So we studied Norway and after we learned a lot about Norway, we went there. We went there to, and I know I'm switching gears here, so I apologize. What I should have been saying, according to my vice president of organization, is that the Evolution Institute decided that how we could prove ourselves is looking at how children learn. So we studied th through different cultures how can a child grow up in an environment where they have a good chance of really being uh, healthy, where they grow up not disliking people from Poland or from Russia or from Israel, anywhere else. And we brought together scholars from all of the different organizations, disciplines, etc., internationally, and we met in Miami, at the University of Miami, and we came up with, this is what nature has to say about little children. And then we did this dastardly thing of actually getting into early learning centers in the state of Florida. I don't know if you've ever heard of what's going on in Florida. We have a couple of guys out there that are like mad cowboys. They're running, uh, I guess, they're not on white horses. They're on uh, this, uh, black horses because that's how we used to stereotype, you know, think white horses are the good cowboys and the black, you know, cowboys are riding on a black horse. That's of course, ridiculous. But what's not ridiculous is today we have, in some of the poorest communities in Florida, which are multiracial, multi-income, funded by the government, say, so we have a funding stream, a permanent funding stream, and these children are actually getting a very good learning experience because we're applying all the different disciplines, plus we're providing them with the, and we're also at the same time helping the parents find a better life for themselves, higher income. We're doing grassroots, bottom-up. We're not talking about it conceptually, we're talking about it in practice. So what are people like me, soon to be 86 years old, and my lovely partner here, who's a couple of months younger, maybe 13 years, but we were really in the trenches. And the trenches is not to, to be saying bad things. We're working with the farm workers of Florida. We're working with the LBGT community. We're working with Planned Parenthood. We're not in silos. A lot of the things that are detrimental to community building and economic development is all the competition between all the groups to want to be, say, my issue, I am for whales. And unless I get my program for whales and we see more whales that are in the ocean, I don't care about anything else. Don't bother me about children. Now, this is not exactly the way it happens, but in the United States there are 1.87 million NGOs and they all are looking for money, and most of them do not survive beyond the third year. 
We're now in our 15th year and we're international and we have a relationship with Norway, and, but we're also looking at the UN metrics. You know, what is it that is a high quality of life society? So we're it's not saying I like to be in Jamaica because they have these nice resorts and I can go there. So that's as far as some people get. They go to see the resorts in Jamaica, but it isn't the country with the highest quality of life. If we look at metrics from the UN and we sub-aggregate them to even regions of the country, then the Basque region of Spain has the most democratic worker cooperative system on the planet. So on our board of directors is the dean of the, one of the colleges of Mondragon University, which is a beacon of developing cooperative programs and, and transforming organizations into cooperatives. So our two models, which I leave you today with, are Norway, if it doesn't turn out like the United States, which could happen, and the Mondragon, Spain area, where the Basque people have developed a tremendous dem democratic workplace. And we are working with them, and what's very important here is, in evolutionary theory, is, is reciprocity, reciprocity. How do you benefit together? So it's not a zero-sum game, there are mutual benefits. If anything I've said to you, since I'm sure after four or five hours of this, we'll all be very exhausted, please go to our website, evolution-institute.org, because there's a wealth of information. I also brought enough business cards to leave with everyone here. So if you want to talk to Jen, or you want to talk to Nina, or last choice, me, please, please take the card, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, I think you've definitely stimulate, stimulated people's appetite for knowing more about Darwin, about the Evolution Institute. Uh, now, uh, I have the last man from the trenches here uh, sitting in front of us, uh, Eric Sulheim, who is the former Minister of uh, Development, the former Minister of Environment in Norway. Now he is a visiting professor lecturing at the university in Beijing and other Chinese universities being advisor to India, being all over the world, advising uh, leaders uh, and businesses of how to run their future, so to speak. So he's the man of the future. He's one of these homo futurus species, right, from Norway. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that one of the things that strikes us is uh, about Norway is the kind of the dialogic imagination which rules the political life and also the ability to form coalitions, something that is lame in Poland. To talk together, to uh, work together with antagonists, this is what uh, David was talking about, and also what Sarah was talking about, you know, to, op to be open to a conversation. And it seems to me that Eric belongs to this uh, species. Uh, and uh, just to illustrate, I I'm sorry I'm taking just 30, minute, 30 seconds to illustrate what he is about uh, and what Norway is about. Some 20 years ago, I had an African student at the university who said, listen, Nina, I had some ideas about how to improve development in Norway. And you know what I did? I took the telephone catalog and I looked up Eric Sulheim, who was the Minister of De uh, Development, and I rang him and I said, uh, Eric, I have a few ideas for you about who you, how you can improve the Norwegian development. Would you listen to me? And Eric invited me for tea. So this is the kind of, this, is the, this can only happen in Norway. Uh, I don't know if it's still happening, but I think that was uh, something that was absolutely seductive about uh, being in the country where the distance between politicians and the citizens and the, uh, you know, it's simple people from the street, students, is so short. So um, our dream speaker, um, Eric. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Nina, and good morning, Warsaw. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I have listened very carefully to the previous speakers, and I agree to basically everything I've heard. What I would do is to switch the focus somewhat 
from civil society to power, to the inner core of politics, which is in the Western world to win elections. If you cannot win elections, you don't get into power. So that's my focus. Let me start with asking, who is the most successful politician in Europe in this century? To that question, I believe there's just one answer. By far, the most successful politician is Angela Merkel in the 21st century in Europe. She ruled the most powerful nation in Europe for 20 years. She won all elections. She was absolutely not charismatic. She was a very boring speaker. Uh, she was not a master of social media. She didn't have any brave new ideas. What she did have was trust. Uh, she incarnated the best in what it is to be a German. Not the worst of German history, for sure not. But the pragmatism, the can-do attitude, let's get things done, let's find the solutions, let's be down to earth, let's be, be with the people. And she incarnated trust. To ask the American question, would you want to buy a used car for that lady? 99% of Germans will say, yes, I want. Even if they were a left-wing extremist or on the absolute right, they would buy a used car from Angela Merkel, and that's why she did win elections. And that's a lesson learned to everyone in every nation, at every continent. Trust is the currency of politics. Business is money, civil society may be attention, social media is attention, sports is maybe being brave and strong in politics. Trust is number one. If you are not trusted, you cannot win elections, and you cannot be trusted if you are not seen as a person close to the people you want to represent. So this is my main message, and I will try to approach it from different angles. The biggest mistake political people do is exactly what Sarah spoke to, is you believe that everyone else is like yourself. I'm not no expert of Polish politics and I will not dig deep into Polish politics, but I would not be surprised if a number of intellectuals in a city like Warsaw, they speak to each other and they don't go to the countryside of Lublin, they don't go to the coal mines of Katowice, they don't go to Sarkopane to see the people who run the tourist business there. They simply don't understand their own people when they design their campaigns. Maybe Poland is the exception, but this is how intellectuals run political campaigns in the United States and in many other countries in Europe, and that's why we fail. So there is one advice in one sentence for anyone who wants to run a campaign in Poland. Go out there and speak. If you, by lottery, can get 100 people to speak to, as we heard here, that's fantastic. If you cannot, just go to a cafe in the rural parts of Lublin and sit there and speak to people and listen to their views, their desires, how they want to live their life, and then build a campaign who can encompass everyone, not just a small group. Look in the United States of America, if you are a young, aspiring Asian American woman in California, chance of voting Democratic is 90%. If you are an older, white, industrial worker, maybe retired in Oklahoma, the chance of voting Trump is also 90%. It's an absolute divide, and anyone who wants to win elections needs 50%. Well, if you're a small party, you can be satisfied with five. But if you want to rule a country, you need 50%. And hopefully more. But if you need 50%, you need to build a wide tent. I will give you three main lessons from elections in Norway, but in the world. Some of them, I think, may be provocative, but it's much better to understand where the world is today than to build our campaigns on fantasies. And these three lessons is, number one, you need to build a big tent. Secondly, the main ideology in today's world is nationalism, basically everywhere. And thirdly, if you want to win elections, 
please start to fight from below rather than top down. Okay, you need to build a big tent. I mean, that's obvious. If you want 50% of the votes, it cannot just be one small group of people. In the United Kingdom, in 1910, industrial workers were 50% of the population. That's the one and only time that one group has been more than 50% in any nation anywhere in the world, except, of course, farmers, if you go long back in history. So if you want a big tent, you need to appeal to a huge amount of people. In Norway, we formed a coalition government of three parties, which did exactly this. Labour Party, which had a strong roots in the trade union movements among industrial workers. Centre Party, which was strong in the countryside among farmers and rural people. And my party, the Socialist Party, which has main attraction to, let's call them, younger, more highly educated people in the cities. But together, of course, this was 50 plus 1 percent of the votes. So how did we go about to build this into a winning coalition to create the first so-called red-green government in Norway? Because now Germany has a red-green government. But I think we were among the first nations in the world who had a red-green government. First, we built trust among the leadership of the parties, because unless you can kind of salvage the ego issue, not everyone can be the prime minister. Only one can be the prime minister. Only one can be the minister of finance also. So you need to build trust within the core group and the top leaders of the parties, including Jens Stoltenberg, which many of you know is now the Secretary General of NATO. They met, not with media attention, that went a long way to make sure that the media was not aware, uh, not aware of the meetings, and that pits us together to start building confidence. They ne don't, didn't necessarily start loving each other. They didn't become a family, but they started respecting each other in such a way that they could work together for a long-term project, which lasted for eight years. And still, I think they are on very good speaking terms. But creating that trust is core because political movements tend to be, have so many egos. People who believe my small group, and particularly myself, is so important. That's much more important than the big picture. Even if we cannot win elections, if I can do well, that, that's so, so important. So bring that cohesion and make sure that there is a strong sense of human uh, common purpose. That's incredibly important. Second, we highlighted what are the winning proposals of such a coalition. What were the reforms we could introduce in Norway, which will be broad-based within our group of voters. For instance, we promised that we will make, give kindergartens to every child in Norway. And we will reduce, uh, the, uh, we will expand the, pre, the um, uh, maternity and paternity leave for women and men. That, of course, appeals to everyone. No one was really opposed, but no one had really made this a clear promise. And we delivered. Now, every person in Norway has maternity or paternity leave until the child is one. And from one to six, we have a legal right to kindergarten. It was a strong promise. It was hard to deliver, but we delivered. And you have had some issues where people say, wow, this guy, they, they delivered it did what they promised. We changed tax systems to be more fair. We had a strong green uh, agenda. And Norway, during those days, for instance, uh, started the global campaign for to conserve the rainforest and a number of other. We started what is today a huge success in Norway, which is our penetration of electric cars. Uh, last month in Norway, 87% of all cars bought were electric. And that was policies set during those days. So we found the areas which were non-controversial within the coalition and, of course, highlighted that to the voters. And thirdly, we looked into the really difficult issues where there were disagreement among the coalition partners. One was membership in the European Union. As you know, Norway is outside the European Union. And we decided that we will not rock that when we were in government there will be no application for Norway to join the Union, 
but nor will there be any changes in our so-called European Economic Area uh, Agreement, which makes Norway for all practical purposes members of the European Union. But that was highly controversial, so a compromise formula would have to be fine. Now the issue was the war in Afghanistan, which was a very, very uh, big issue at the time. Some parties uh, was wanted to withdraw from Afghanistan. I personally think that would have been the right thing to do at the time, with the benefit of hindsight, but at the time it was not so obvious. So we decided we will not withdraw, but on the other hand, we will not expand the Norwegian uh, uh, forces in Afghanistan either. So this policy of bringing cohesion in the core group, setting the targets which are non-controversial, which, which can appeal to the voters, and solve the most difficult controversial issues, that laid the platform, which was, uh, was ending up at the, as the, as the, um, uh, as, uh, as the winning formula for this coalition. And, but as we heard here, it's all about trust. If the leaders are not trusted, if people don't trust you to deliver, they won't vote for you. For the ordinary citizens, giving the vote is, you are, you are not, not doing that randomly. Most people take that very, very seriously. And they want someone to represent them who they believe can take their aspirations forward, will make the life of themselves and their children better, and you need to gain that trust and you need to gain it con constantly. So that's number one, build a big tent, but doing it in such a way that you can, uh, that you can appeal to everyone. The second, which is maybe more uh, controversial in this room, is, the, is nationalism. Nationalism, in my view, is now by far in every society I know of the most important ideology. No one believes in the right left wing differences any, any longer. Look, most of the so called right wing populist parties of Europe have a left wing economic agenda. Their vision is a much, much stronger welfare state, just only for the Norwegians, not for the Pakistani migrants, only for the Swedes, not for the people coming from Turkey, only for the Belgians, not from those coming from Africa. But it's not center, it's not left, right. The issue of the state is solved everywhere in Europe, in the United States it's not solved. No one is really fighting any hard struggle about the, 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 <coughs> the size of the state. Or no one successfully can claim that you need to drastically reduce the taxes on rich people and put more taxes on the poor. No one can win an election in any European nation on that program. So left-right is very, of very limited interest everywhere. Nationalism and populism is center stage. This is not new. When Europe started modernizing in the 19th century, the issue every nation outside was facing was following. How can we modernize without, without westernize? And the first nation who cracked that code was Japan. In 1870s, there was a revolution, so-called major revolution in Japan. Japan, in three decades, kept up with Europe, became a huge military power, became very modern, laid out rail lines, did exactly what Europe had done before it, but it didn't become European. Japan is still very definitely Japanese, and while Japan is a democracy, the same political party has basically won every election in Japan for the last 70 years. So it's nothing like what we hear there from Italy where you're switching chairs <laughs> every, every month. But Japan cracked that code. Korea, well, Korea is one of the most modern societies in the world and now richer than Japan per capita. And Korea exporting K-pop and K-movies to the entire world. Korea is today the second most important culture export in the world next to the United States of America. And it's distinctly Korean. I mean, it's in Korean language. The K-pop bands don't, they don't sing in English. Like every modern Norwegian band would do, they sing in Korean. Still, my 17-year-old daughter went to Paris to go to a K-pop concert. Even the moderator concert spoke in Korean. What an enormous success in modernizing while keeping your culture. 
We go to Turkey. Erdogan's formula is more Islam and more modernity. Now, Narendra Modi's formula in India is more Hinduism and more modernity. They're building vast IT centers while speaking more about Shiva and Ganesh and the Hindu, uh, Hindu gods. And in China, of course, in China is the most, in many ways now, the most modern society in the world while at the same time being a lot more confusion than they were 10 years or 20 years ago. And wherever we are, and Poland, of course, has a richer history than, I mean, all nations have a rich history, but the Polish history may be particularly rich. And anyone who wants to win an election in Poland, I'm convinced, need to be seen as a carrier of Polish nationalism. No one will win if you're seen as someone put from outside into your political ecosystem. That's a recipe for disaster, not just in Poland, but everywhere else. And the one reason, uh, the one issue Democrats, like all of us, need to consider is the following. Nearly all Europeans prefer the democratic system. Most people in the world also prefer the democratic system. But people only at large prefer the democratic system if it delivers. Look, the only real contender to democracy in the world is China. Because that's the only really well-functioning autocratic system anywhere in the world. But if China provides more economic growth, better care for the poor people, and much faster transition into green economy, more harmony in society, well, Singapore has done all this as an authoritarian society, and China is on the way to that. Then, people still don't want the Chinese political model, but they do want the Chinese political results. And democracies need to deliver, and the debate on democracy is won in the abstract terms. Uh, and the first years after, say, 1989 in Eastern Europe, or after fascism in Spain and Portugal, or after Pinochet in, in Chile, Everyone won an election on, de on democracy. But in the last few years, there are very few signals that democracy alone is enough to win an election. If that had been the case, why did Orban win so convincingly in Hungary? Why did Erdogan win so convincingly in Turkey last week if democracy had been the main concern of the voters? I think nearly all voters want democracy, but they want a democracy which delivers, and delivers in social and environment and many other terms, and that's what we need to consider. And I believe that nationalism at the moment is a stronger vote puller than democracy in nearly all societies, so people need to find the balance if they want to win elections. And lastly, the vast majority of people are lower middle class or poor or at the very minimum middle class. The elite in every society is very small. If your appeal is mainly to the elite, you will lose. Everyone who's seen as fighting from below is winning. It may be surprising for those who don't know Turkey that Erdogan won so convincingly the election in Turkey. 80% inflation. It's basically, every Western media was negative to Erdogan. They claimed that he will had messed up the response to the earthquake in eastern Turkey. Well, Erdogan wanted an absolutely convincing victory in exactly the earthquake areas. He, he did better there than in, on average in Turkey. And Erdogan is seen by most Turks as fighting from below. He has been the leader of the land for 20 years. Still, most Turks believe that, yes, he is fighting for be from below, while the opposition is fighting from above, meaning from nice air-conditioned rooms uh, in uh, Istanbul or other big cities. So whatever you do to win an election, please be seen as fighting from below. People, low upstarts, the low people who are like them, the low people are seen as fighting from below and winning. If you, start, if you are seen as fighting from above, you have a much, much more difficult way to victory. 
Lastly, since I started with the most successful politician in Europe this decade, let me wind up with what I consider the most successful politician in the world today. And I guess most of you have not so much knowledge about India, but I believe the most successful political leader in any nation in today's world is Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India. There have been a lot of global polls where people are asked about the support of the leader of their nation. Narendra Modi is polling 80%. 80% of Indians say that it is very good or good. About 40% of Americans say the same about Joe Biden. About 30% in our paradise of Norway uh, is saying the same about my friend, the Prime Minister of Norway. 30% believe he's very good or good. 80% of Indians believe that. Why is that? Because he has made this absolutely perfect merger of the two issues I mentioned here, being seen as the carrier of Indian nationalism and as the person who's fighting for the poor, fighting from below. Something, he has some natural advantages. The parents of Narendra Modi, they were running a small tea stall in a peripheral town of Gujarat, a peripheral state of India. So he comes from absolutely nothing to the peak of power. People like that. His opponent is the fifth generation of the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, who got everything served on a silver plate with silver spoon. People don't really buy into that. And when that contest is there, and Narendra Modi is de delivering to the poor. Uh, he's using the cell phones now to get people to the poor. In the past, there was no way a government could get people to the poor in India, uh, get, get money to the poor. But now, every, even the poorest of the Indians have a cell phone account. So Modi can send money directly into the account of the poor people, and they get it, and no middleman can eat fr from this. That appeals a lot to people. He's a self-made man coming from a poor background, fighting a dynasty, and added he is creating now 7% economic growth and a shared growth where the poor people of India is sh shareholders in the growth of India. That's a very, very strong performance, and that's why most Indians love Modi. I mean, if you go to the intellectuals in, in Mumbai or Delhi, and I know all this very well, very few people support Modi. But if there are 140 cities in India, bigger than my, my city of Oslo. There are at least 100 cities bigger than Dublin. People are living in these cities, and they're living in the 700,000 villages of India. And Modi is their hero, and that's the way to win elections. And secondly, has changed completely the narrative of India. Historical narrative of India, which many of us will like, was a secular state for everyone. Modi is saying, no, 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 no. The tradition, the inner core of India is Hinduism. There's no way you can separate Hinduism from, uh, from our nation. Maybe as there is no way you can separate Catholicism, Catholicism from Poland. I mean, that's for you to, you to judge, but at least that's the message of Modi. You cannot separate Hinduism from India, for 3,000 years we were Hindus, then some foreign intellectuals came with Islam or Christianity. These were foreign ideologies who impeached upon India, but we want to go back to the core of India, which is Ganesh, Hanuman, Shiva, Vishnu, all the Hindu panorama of gods. That's a very, very, very strong message to all those ladies out there in the villages who go to the temple every single day. There is a vibrancy in the temples in India which we can only dream of if we are church leaders in Europe. People are going to the temples, lighting the lamp, praying for something, maybe to get some more food, or praying that the children will get a better wife or a new wife. There are, people have any amount of concerns, but they go to the temple to share these concerns, and Modi is their man. So this combination of nationalism and 
fighting from below, fighting for the people, has made him by far the most popular leader in his own country of any nation in the world. I will leave it for you to draw any conclusions on Poland because I'm very, very far from being an expert on Poland. But I still believe that in all nations I know of, being seen as the carrier of your own na nation's history, traditions, and best practice, and being seen as fighting for the ordinary people from below, is a winning formula which is enormously, enormously strong. Thank you so much and looking forward to the discussion. Eric, for this very provocative lecture uh, or presentation. Uh, I know that some of you are starving for a coffee. I wonder now uh, whether we should actually go on because we only have about uh, 35 minutes to lunch and uh, invite our speakers to the table and ask questions and come for, you know, and, and simply present comments because some of you might have reflections on what has been said today. So why don't, Sarah, could you please come, come in here and Jerry as well and David? And if there are any questions to Petros, who is here from Brussels, as you know, uh, Brussels may not be the nest of the most popular politicians in the world, but it is, <laughs> it has to be taken into account. Not to mention that they have also co-financed this, uh, this uh, meeting and this session. So thank you very much, Petros. Uh, any questions or comments or ideas from on the part of the audience are very much welcome here at this stage. Mor yes, you can speak Polish. We have a translator who will uh, will try to do the simultaneous interpretation inter interpreting. Yes, please. Okay, uh, hello, uh, I have uh, a question. Um, as a journalist, I would like to wonder what are the uh, three points of the fact uh, that the democracy of the state is only visual and uh, the citizens are actually facing dictatorship, but yet in a slight form. So what are the key points of dictatorship being started in a state? Clearly, in, in the United States, um, there are no restrictions on how people can spend their money to get their way. So in, in a society where there are no limitations on campaign financing, and there's no limitation on how much companies, companies are people in the United States, they're like human beings, they can spend all the money they want. So you have a situation where money is influencing power, which is influencing attitudes of people, which is going through social media, and which is going through uh, Fox Network, which is owned by an uh, Australian who has a lot of influence all over. So that, that is a very, plus the educational system is very fragmented. Uh, we have uh, over 15,000 school districts in 50 states. And what you find is that in one state they teach that it is wrong to go back and look at your past and learn from it. In another state, they require you to learn about your past. And people who have money don't send their schools to, people to public schools, they send them to private school. And in Florida, where I come from, the government just decided this year that religious schools should be funded, which is in violation of the Florida Constitution. So constitutionalism gets you just so far. Even when you have a constitution which says you cannot 
do that. It's against the the law of the land. They decided that put people in the courts who will agree that it Constitution doesn't say it's like reading the Bible from you know different perspectives. I seem I have to give an answer as well. But he's handing me the microphone. I think uh, the two ways a dictator can come to power: it's the fast way and it's the gradual way. The fast way is the classical military takeovers by military coup d'etats like we've seen in Latin America or in Africa for many years. Today, we see more the gradual way, the sort of elected leaders within the democracy that take power through elections and then successfully transform a democratic country into a democratic shell into something that still looks on the outside like a democracy, but which on the inside has a lot of features of what has been called a post-democracy, an illiberal democracy, um, where classical features of the democracy have been ha hollowed out. And um, this is a dangerous, uh, a, da a more dangerous uh, tendency. It's the, everybody is using the metaphor of the frog these days, the frog when the water is warming up. This is the second scenario. Um, I, I think, I think for me, fear is, is 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 really the main mechanism that's used in dictatorships, and that involves othering of people and creating this narrative of fear around anyone that is not exactly like you. And we see this done very effectively, unfortunately, across the world. And I think, for any country, you should be concerned when seeing those most vulnerable and already most marginalised be put into that role and seeing freedoms and choice roll back upon, whether it's uh, in terms of LGBT rights or it's in terms of women's rights or it's in terms of refugee and, and, and uh, migrant rights, because it is one of the most eff effective and I think deep-rooted emotions that we have is fear. And if you can create a narrative that these people over here are not like you and are a threat to you, then you will, you will split the country quite effectively. And a, a split country that lives in fear is very easy to dominate in any kind of dictatorship. Um, and I think the other thing is around accountability and transparency. If you have a country or government that is not accountable to, to anyone, and, and I learned a little bit last night around the, the Polish system, which believe me, I'm no expert, but if you can make decisions at a political level and at a judicial level without any accountability or transparency around those decisions, then that's a very dangerous place uh, to, to be. Thank you. Eric, a couple of words? Just, Just add, add one uh, main point, and that is I, I believe democracy is as much about culture as it is about laws or system. And the, the main aspect of democracy is the ability to find compromises and to respect that other opinions are legitimate in society. And that's what we're losing in a number of societies. Look, in the, in the United States now, about 30 to 40% of people say that if your son and daughter come back with a member of the other party as a new son-in-law or daughter-in-law, it's a huge problem. That was about 5 or 10% if you go back in history. No one thought of that problem. Now, it's a huge problem for Republican parents if your child and marry a Democrat. And that's because we have st stopped finding compromises, stopped respecting, and stopped at the end believing that the others do this for good. I mean, we disagree, but I, but I still respect that your opinion is also a legitimate opinion, which I should respect. And finding compromises between legitimate opinions, I think, is at the core of democracy, and we need to find back to that. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thomas Kozowski, <coughs> uh, legal and social scientist and activist. Thanks a lot and th inspiring uh, morning in Warsaw in this very special place, as you know, probably. Uh, the first question uh, in relation to, to civil assemblies. Uh, are you considering uh, to put, let's say, to, uh, to combine your concept with the um, parliamentary activity, uh, put it in a, <coughs> in a just... Uh, 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 put it uh, in, a, in a simple way, are you considering, for instance, to create a second or third uh, house of the parliament or to change the house already in existence? 
and uh, a bit commentary, a bit question uh, in relation to nationalism, <laughs> obviously not only. Uh, mm, if I can say so, from my point of view, I think we are facing now uh, the biggest challenge in relation to democracy, obviously yes, but the, to the concept of liberal democracy, and namely just to the concept of liberty as such. Obviously it is the, one of the most important concepts uh, for our societies, I mean, in the Western world. But on the second, uh, from the second point of view, and that's my, let's say, reconsideration of what you just said, we, we've just discovered that liberty, we cannot try liberty as the final goal of social life, on reverse. The liberty, as, <laughs> as your, your, let's say, abortion action, yes, is for something, and that is our discovery, that, yes, we are fighting for the, for the liberal democracy, especially from the rule, po uh, rule of law point of view, I mean, what is going on now in Poland. But secondly, we are facing, we are looking for something. We are looking for our roots, traditional roots, language, uh, culture, and everything. And obviously, especially, we are looking for, for just for a good life, common life, common law, common life. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you for this great question. I do believe that in the end, organizing one of citizens' assemblies is not enough. I believe we will need to institutionalize. And the example in the German-speaking part of Belgium is interesting, because next to the elected parliament, you now have a people's senate drafted by lot. Ideally, I would like to see this repeated on the national level in Belgium. Our senate has very few functions. Many people want to suppress it. This might be the time to turn it into a chamber with the everyday citizens drafted by lot. But in countries like um, France and the Netherlands, where the two chambers have really important functions, you have to keep them. And in France now we see that President Macron is giving more powers to the third parliament. France has like a bit of a third parliament. You have the Assemblée, you have the Senat, and then you have the Social, eco Economic and Ecological uh, Council, which is like a, a third chamber and that is the place where citizens' assemblies are being organized now. Same might happen in the Netherlands. On the European level, we only have one parliament, which is the European Parliament. There is a growing campaign among academics, mostly in Florence at the European University Institute, to make sure that Europe would have a second parliament. Apart from the first parliament that is elected, the one we have now, there should be a second European chamber drafted by lot. So we can just uh, give maybe a more room to the audience and their reflections. Yes, Radek. Uh, Radek Markowski, political science. Uh, I'm running the Polish national election study, among other things. Well, a uh, few qualifications. We are here a couple of uh, people of a, Mike, Mike. a gang of people who is very... Uh, so to say, proud of the uh, political sophistication of the people. We have to be cautious about that. I'm running experiments of what people really know about politics. And you know, we have been seduced, in my view, by this early Almond and Verba 1963 book that, you know, citizens basically open the window in the morning, they look outside and they say, what can I do for my country or for the democracy or what not? These kind of characters are very rare species, to tell you the truth, at least in this country. So I, I was wondering that, you know, coming from a country when Steiner Rocken was so persuasively writing about how political cleavages and institutionalization of the linkage between politics and society happens, we cannot simply just ask people. You know, there is a fantastic book by Soren uh, Holmberg and, uh, and uh, Esiason in 1960. Uh, 96, which is called Democracy from Above, or Political Representation from Above, where for Sweden they make a clear, clear uh, uh, point that unless political parties socialize citizens to certain ideas, 
we end up in mess, in chaos, right? So, uh, indeed, well, of course, the uh, citizens has changed since then, but the, nevertheless, the, the political agency is something that is very, very important in my view. And uh, the uh, other comment about, uh, well, Erdogan and Turkey, so, well, we have in political science this notion of uneven playing field, you know, I mean, Congratulations to Erdogan for my political tastes were <laughs> overblown. Uh, it was a classical, uh, he won by 3% above 50, so this was not a landslide. And had it been a just election, the likelihood that the opposition democratic leader would have won are pretty high. So one has to be careful when this you know, minor uh, wins of autocratic leaders happen to say just that, you know, Turks, this or that. This is a 100 million country, and they are very, very different there. Thank you. Just one comment upon uh, Turkey and one upon Rokkan. Uh, on Turkey, I mean, you are right in everything you say. But also please note that the Turks in Germany, for instance, overwhelmingly supported Erdogan. And in, in Germany, all German language media is resolutely against, more or less all of them, resolutely against Erdogan. So a population of Turks in Germany who has absolutely all access to anti-Erdogan uh, views still voting uh, massively for Erdogan. So I think we should accept that, yes, the playing field was not right. Yes, everything you say is right. But Erdogan also commands support from a huge amount of Turks because of who he, who he is and uh, what he has done for Turkey. If you don't understand that, we will simply fail to understand what happened in Tur Turkey. But yes, the playing field was not fair. Uh, secondly, on Rokkan. I mean, Rokkan is one of the greatest scientists in Norway at any time fantastically good and, and looking into cleavages in society. But I think we fail if we don't understand how much this has changed also. Because historically, of course, the main divide in Europe between left and right was about the size of the state that has diminished its basically non-existence as a political uh, debacle at the moment. And the second was, would you prefer to have lower taxes for the rich or upper middle class, or would you prefer to tax them to redistribute to those at the lower end of the scale? So it was working class against middle class, it was more state against less state, all that has basically disappeared. To the extent that the strongest voting groups for most right-wing populist parties in Europe and indeed in the United States is what we can call the white lower middle class and working class. So the traditional voters for what was labor, trade unions and social democratic parties are now the strongest voters for the Swedish Democrats in Sweden, from progressive party in my nation Norway, for the AFD in Germany, for Mr. Mrs. Melone in Italy, and you can go around, and Madame Le Pen in, in France. The more you live in the sophisticated par parts of Paris, the more likely there are you are voting for Macron. I mean, he won Paris by something like 85%, 80 to 85%, while just winning the average population by 58. So the, the, we need to understand that this has changed, and we need to respond to the issues of our time. And I believe the two main issues to respond to in our time is how to fight from below, uplift the people who don't feel included in society, and the second is to have to respond to the nationalist tendency in all nations. Okay, you probably will disagree, or Radek is burning to disagree with you, but you can continue the disagreement <laughs> afterwards, and now we want David to say a few words. V very briefly on your first question, you're right, everyday people lack political sophistication, I don't agree when you say, and only political parties are there to socialize citizens. What you see in citizens' assemblies is that academic experts play an excellent role at making people more competent. The process we need to talk on party funding had, you know, professors in political science, some of your colleagues probably, coming and explain to citizens how things work, and it was 
it was fascinating to see the transformation from everyday passive citizens into knowledgeable actors. Thank you very much. There are, yes, could we just uh, give maybe yes, some, yeah, yeah, yes, please, yeah, but, but very shortly. Yeah, I understand, uh, understand short, yes. I don't want to give the impression that we all agree on everything. I think it's important that you understand I don't agree with systemically some of the things that are being said. I think we need to understand humans have to form larger groups successfully. We would still be in tribes if the contemporary version of tribalism is nationalism. So if you want the 21st century tribalism and you want to maintain this system, it's not going to be successful because you and most countries in the world are under the influence of neoliberalism. And that's coming from outside of this country, and that's also helping you to think in terms of nationalism, because it serves the interest, and that's the default for the world. You now have a super organism, and that is a transmitted organism. So mm -hmm. nationalism and, and, and compromise is not always a good thing. It can be very bad. I keep dancing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Maria Gaciak. I'm from Shipyard Foundation, and we are the team running this process. Um, you s I have a question for David. Uh, you said about the, your bottom-up process that you were running, and ours was also a bottom-up process. And you said that you had politicians within the process. And I wanted I, my my question is really practical one. I wanted to find out how did you work with the politicians where when did they engage and what is the effect of this engagement in the end? Thank you. I think, yes, because we are the same team. Uh, I was curious, that's probably for David and Sarah, because you have some nice stories of citizen engagement in your uh, countries in Belgium, Ireland. And uh, could you tell us a little bit more to what extent people like Belgian people and uh, Irish people recognize and notice these processes, like the wider society, or did you, what, what, what have you, done <laughs> or what, um, what you did to make them recognize them like so they are for example Irish and they know that's what what's uh, what Irish people do they do citizen assemblies and so on thank you very quickly um, how do you engage politicians especially when you're going to talk about their money but actually, it's our money. We give it to them. So for us, it was important to talk with party leaders before, during, and after the panel. For the better part of my previous 12 months, I've spent time with the party leaders. It's, n it's a dirty job, but someone has to do it, right? Um, but it was really interesting to go and talk to them in an early stage and to let them uh, an exchange. And I, I learned a lot from these discussions what was important for them, what was critical. And the fact that we came with the topic that was dangerously populist, and we said that, but we are going to treat it in an anti-populist way, created a lot of confidence. The fact that 10 out of 12 political parties uh, accepted the invitation was a, f was a result of these, these ch uh, talks. And they continue, so which is a good, important. Reaching the wider public, it's a, it's a lot of campaigning. Uh, I, I wish we had had Sarah in Belgium. I think she's done an incredible job. Um, we Need to Talk was very successful in uh, reaching out to politicians, newspapers, media, etc. But we, as a bottom-up initiative, we chose not to build the biggest of campaigns. We said, like, it's more important to convince politicians and the ones in the parliament than reaching out to the public at large. We're doing this on a broader scale, but this can be done. Only the topic of abortion is one it's easier to build an emotional connection with than the topic of party financing. Yes, 
Sarah, do you want to add anything? Yes, absolutely, and, and, and I agree in ways we had an easier uh, job to, to alert the public around our Citizens' Assembly because it was such an emotive and social issue. Um, our first Citizens' Assembly, which was primarily around same-sex marriage, I would argue that probably no one in the general public was aware that that was happening because it was a brand new democratic process and not a huge amount of work would have gone in by the state you know, to publicise this new process. Abortion was a bit different because it was such a high profile issue to begin with and that this was seen as a further kind of rubber stamping of, of that, the, you know, the, the adequate thought and procedures were going into this this process of debating that issue. I would have hopes for the future that, that we, we have currently have more citizens assemblies just beginning um, around a, a range of issues and there is more talk about these than I have ever seen in the public discourse. So I suppose we're relatively young in our citizens assembly journey, this is coming on to number three, but people are starting to engage with it, the media are starting to report about it more and people are starting to understand the process and um, definitely welcome the process because without something like Citizens Assembly, it is top down for the most part. So I think we'll continue to grow once we have a few more under Great. our belt. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we, we got the point now. Uh, Atle. Atle, I'm... Uh, <coughs> So I say I'm here with Nina and uh, coming from uh, business school in Oslo. I have two observations and, and, and questions pending from them, and I'm going to be short. There seems to be a very intriguing and interesting contradiction here between the power perspective that Eric Solheim is uh, discussing, having experience, of course, from uh, the center of power in government, and David and Sarah's uh, perspective where you're actually basically trying to maneuver out of politics and taking down the power game in order to have a, a, a truer deliberative dialogue. Yet at the some point, power has to be consolidated in the country. You cannot live without governments for too long. So how do we kind of align or interface these two positions or are you at war between each other? I, I'm just confused. I think it's an extremely important question. The second observation, I, I must say, because it's extremely uh, important to, to voice it here, is a reflection I got from Eric Solheim's point about uh, nationalism. What does your strong thesis, and I think uh, there's a lot uh, to be said for it, not necessarily normative, but factually, uh, what does this imply for Europe? Where is the European nationalism or is Europe doomed because it cannot have nationalism in its true sense and will always have a war with the nation states below it? And uh, national and, and the citizens assemblies, uh, David, any comment? Yes. We are not at war. I think good traditional power politics is important and will remain so for the next decades. Yet I'd be very worried if nothing happens on the side of democratic innovation. So yes, we need to build a big tent and make sure you have coalitions that can deliver, of course. But I would be very worried if Norwegian democracy or Polish democracy or Belgian democracy would continue to do business as usual as if nothing has, has changed. I think we need to move towards a, a convergence of these two tendencies, traditional electoral politics on the one hand and democratic innovation on the other hand. I was slightly worried in Eric's story that the, the biggest success story from the recent past was Angela Merkel, and the biggest success stories from the present are Modi and Erdogan. Uh, uh, yes, indeed, they have won democratic elections, but it's not necessarily sure that their policies are the fruit of deep democratic cultures. As a matter of fact, uh, a number of national socialist regime in a couple of decades ago came to power through elections, and they would have fitted perfectly the yeah. definition of success that Eric just gave. Uh, until they started to hollow out the democratic culture of the country. So uh, I do agree with Eric to the given point, but I would strongly suggest that please 
let us stop thinking that the only way to do democracy is through the electoral way. We need to involve citizens in a meaningful way. Ticking a box once every four or five years is no longer enough. I'd be interested to see what Turkish people in Germany and in my own street in Brussels who had Turkish flags out this week, I'd be really interested to see how they would express themselves in a Turkish citizens' assembly. Eric, do you have a comment? I don't see any immediate uh, difference between these two perspectives. I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, uh, uh, everyone would agree that unless you make sure that the power is held by people who want to promote democracy, I mean, all the efforts like you propose will be much more difficult. On the other hand, you need you need uh, movements from below to keep politicians accountant, accountable, but also to bring new ideas and innovation in society. So these two, I, I think, can come together, but they may be more easy in relatively homogeneous societies like Norway than in, in some other, other parts of the world. Uh, on Erdogan and Modi, I think uh, we can, that, that's a big discussion. Uh, uh, Modi is today very successful, Erdogan of course much less so, I mean Turkey has huge economic difficulties as everyone know. What was surprising was that Erdogan won despite a skyrocketing inflation. I can tell you the Prime Minister of Norway, if we had had 40, even 80% inflation, <laughs> we would have got 2% of the votes or zero. There's no way you can win an election in Norway if inflation goes skyrocketing like that. Still, even with his huge economic difficulties in Turkey, he won. And of course, in elections, you are as good as your opponent. If you are better than the opponent, I mean, you can be pretty bad. I mean, the two least popular candidates for presidents in the United States were Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. They're much less popular than any other contender for the presidency. But since Hillary was so bad, still Trump was seen by most Americans at a little bit better and then they voted for him. So in politics, you just need to be better than an opponent and that may also be a factor in, in Turkey yeah. that Erdogan was seen as better than his opponent. That's Modi is generally popular by the vast majority of Indians and we can discuss later whether that's dangerous or good. That's the Norwegian pragma pragmatic approach. Now we have three, uh, three inter four interventions. Can, can I just, wh while you're passing the microphone, I might just add, um, I absolutely don't think that these are processes that are at odds with each other. They have to be complementary to each other. And I suppose just not to miss that at a very fundamental level, party politics, those elected into party politics, their job is to represent those who elect them as well as representing a vision for the country. It is their responsibility to be connected and find out what that citizen process wants and needs from them. And I don't know whether, you know, Ireland is quite a small country, so we might have a different relationship. We would know our politicians quite well <laughs> and quite locally. Um, and so it should never be forgotten that politicians who are elected or otherwise are people as well and they, they will respond to the same the same processes it, it, i do think it's it they are not ordained it, it, from from heaven it, it isn't correct to to forget that they are they are also people and they will respond to the same kind of pulls and messaging and language that everyone else does so they shouldn't be put on such, such a pedestal um by us you know despite the fact that they are elected i think is important to remember uh, I'm Paweł Kaczak, uh, Obywatel RP, which is a civic movement known for civil disobedience. Plus, we demand strengthening our democracy now among the democratic opposition parties, which makes us, uh, which sets us in a positions of rebel within our political rebels with, within our political camp. And we also are the ones who have. Uh, this demand to establish now a, a third civic chamber within the parliament or outside of it, uh, uh, defined as a citizens um, uh, assembly, as you, David, um, uh, have just put it. I have a question because I just don't, I'm not sure, I want to make sure how it was in Ireland. Uh, prior to the citizens uh, the assembly there debating on abortion issues, where they promised that their conclusions would be kept up by the parliament or it happened afterwards? Um, 
thank just, you. Uh, no, uh, and that is not, as, uh, well, certainly not in our citizens' assemblies, that is not the process. Um, they are not promised that their recommendations will be upheld by government. Their report is submitted into government and then it enters into committee stages where it is discussed by further expert um, committees within the parliament. And so, in fact, in Ireland, the report prepared by the Citizens' Assembly was stronger and, and went further than what eventually came in the referendum in terms of proposed legislation. I'm sorry, I just have to quit because Nina rushes me up. So, 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 uh, yes, I want to risk my life, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. One question, one uh, guest in this uh, symposium. So what we have here is the lady. I listened to Talk FM yesterday. I listened to Professor Bitoszek, and this is why we drove together with my husband 80 kilometers to here to this conference from a very small uh, town in uh, uh, Poland, profound Poland. This town is called Rawa Mazowiecka, where most of the population are believers and churchgoers. Church, which is kind of a third chamber in Poland, or maybe just quite simply, it is the third ch chamber from my point of view. It is just an opinion, as we say nowadays in Poland, just an opinion. And just a question to you. Do you think that the priests, which are politicians per procura, uh, who are influencing people, believers or not believers, but churchgoers, pretending being believers maybe. Do you think this is acting from the bottom or rather per procura acting from the top? No, okay. In an Irish context, I, I might say, because this would have been very common for us uh, given the issue and given Irish, Ireland being a very Catholic country, this happened regularly and it, it were from the pulpit, priests and bishops and so on would express an opinion, not generally a very positive one, um, with regards to abortion. This was never received well um, and often not received well by the congregation themselves because it was not felt to represent them and their views, but rather an, an institution, while not a political institution, another very large institution being the Catholic Church and organized religion. And it, it was interesting for such a, you know, a history of Catholicism in Ireland, this was never received well, um, which we wouldn't have known before it happened, to be honest, which way it would have went. The media never picked it up well, people on the ground never, never picked it up. So it certainly seemed that it was not their opinion, but rather an opinion from on high. But that's, that is, I can only tell you about Ireland. Hi. Christian Polomski, Rural Development Foundation. And mm, I have one question to all of you. Uh, it's about neighborhoods. And uh, we have in Poland huge challenge how to work with neighborhoods because uh, if we want to political change in our landscape, in our political landscape, we have to work with uh, neighborhoods, with small communities. and. Um, I want to uh, ask you, do you have any tips? You can think about one tip, uh, uh, how to work with rural communities, how to work with neighborhoods and uh, um, in your context, in your country. And uh, do you have any good uh, examples or method, practice and so on? It's, it I would be very grateful for your sharing. And I need to pass this microphone here. May I um, answer that question along with the others? The reason we have had success politically and working in communities primarily is that most of the people in the United States who live in these communities aren't even registered to vote. So I thought what was important here was the October election and we'd be talking about nuts and bolts. You know, how do you win that election? So we're talking about uh, Aristotle, who was anti-democratic, we're talking about nationalism, and we're not talking about how to build coalitions. If you go to our website, we've been working for 30 years in neighborhoods in central Florida 
where there has been the most rapid population growth in the United States of America. And we've been bringing to them political consciousness. We've been also delivering services, and they become more conscious of the role of politics. Not when somebody comes in there for their vote, you know, two, three weeks before the election, but year-round. And I have been going with my wife around the state of Florida before we came here, talking to mayors, talking to county commissioners in both political parties, but primarily Democratic Party, because this is about more than women's rights, which is crucial. It's more than about all the things that value it in life. So if you want to talk about community building, trust building, getting out a maximum vote, getting people motivated, talk to us. Um. Oh, sorry, I thought it's not working. Um, I'm Justyna Nakielska, Campaign Against Homophobia Advocacy Officer. Oh, um, Justyna Nakielska, Campaign Against Homophobia Advocacy Officer. Uh, I was really impressed by all your comments and um, presentations. Uh, they give us some hope, I guess. Uh, but as a human rights activist, I have a question to Sarah about your campaigning. Um, I was thinking about some challenges you might have uh, had during uh, the uh, abortion campaign in, uh, in Ireland. I know in the past uh, as well, when Simon Weil was um, actively fighting for abortion in the 70s, last century in France, uh, she had, I guess, a similar choice to make, um, whether to s stick to the messages that were important for women uh, when they were fighting for abortion, uh, or choose and change the key messages uh, that were working more for civil society as a whole, public opinion as a whole, and politicians. Um, that's our problem as well. When we fight for human rights, we work with identities and something that is very personal. Um, you know, you often uh, think, how much can you change your key messages for a campaign? Uh, I would very much appreciate your insight, how to reconcile both positions. Th thank thank you. you so much. I, I, was, I was kind of hoping someone might ask this question because it is one of the most complex parts because while in a campaign like a referendum, you commit to a shared goal and you do everything you can to try and get that one goal over the line. Issues are not siloed from each other. They are intersectional, you know, they are connected. And so we definitely had issues around this. For instance, we had, prior to calling a public vote and trying to bring the general public along with us, we were very, very strong supporters of of migrant communities, of the LGBT community, of the trans community, of sex workers, of, of, of a whole range of, of very vulnerable communities. And now we had to switch into a message that was for the general public and for, we used to call them the movable middle, that you had everyone over here who was already your base. They were already convinced, you know, and they held the same values as we did and they were, you know, good, strong values and they were inclusive and diverse. And then you had the movable middle in the middle and they were your big chunk. They were the important people. And then over here you have people who will never vote, you know, in your favor anyway, so you don't spend a lot of time on them. They can vote whatever way they please. So, for two ways that this came up, and I'll just be very honest in my answer of two issues we had. One was around uh, trans identity and some, some trans campaigners who, who all worked hard on this campaign, wanting to talk about trans pregnancy on the doors. Um, and we were faced, I suppose, with the reality that Ireland and Irish voters were not able for this complexity. They could barely talk about abortion and reproductive rights, never mind layering on another issue on top of it. And so we did encourage people to simplify the message and not get into this type of complexity on the doors because we had to, it, was, it always came back to who are you speaking to? They're the priority, not who's doing the speaking. And that can be, you know, we sacrificed a lot, you know, in terms of personally sacrificing on some of, some of the ways that in an ideal world we would have liked to do things in order to get it over the line. What helped us and what I suppose consoled us was always that if we don't pass the Eighth Amendment, no other change will happen, ever. And if we lost that referendum, we knew we might not get another referendum for 20 years, 30 years. 
And so getting it that far was crucial and that we could start to build on, on, on more important issues on top of that. But without that base, we had nothing to build from. So it wasn't easy um, at all. And I suppose that the last thing I'll say is that for a lot of people who were the most marginalized, and, and this came up in particular with migrant groups in Ireland, that if we didn't pass the removal of the Eighth Amendment, it was them that would suffer most. It was, it was predominantly migrant women, uh, women of color who died under the Eighth Amendment in Ireland. Generally, Irish white women could afford to travel to the UK and had the visa and the documentation to do so. A lot of the time it was refugees who did not and would die in, in hospitals. So they were, while they weren't always comfortable with the messaging that was that little bit more medium of the road, you know, palatable, soft, they knew that really they would be the ones to suffer not us, not me, I could travel, I could pay, it would be them that would suffer. So there was, in that uncomfortableness, a reality around, okay, we all know what has to happen here. But it was difficult, I'll, I won't sugarcoat that. First of all, the campaign for abortion in Ireland, in my view, is one of the greatest miracle of political campaigning in modern times. I mean, Sarah, I think you agree. Uh, no one thought you could achieve 66%. I mean, some people thought you could narrowly win, but yeah. not that you could win overwhelmingly like you did. And that's so the lessons here to how to frame the message in such a way that it can appeal to basically everyone, whatever these people, whatever their opinion on everything else, how to make them support that campaign, I think is fantastic and there's so much to learn. And that also answers a lot to your question, how to work with communities. I believe the number one is to understand that God gave us one mouth and two ears. That is because we should listen more than we speak. And what campaigners so often get wrong is they go to the community and tell them what they should do. If you want to work with a community, starting point is go there, knock some doors, ask the people if you can sit down, have a coffee or a vodka, I don't know what you drink uh, in the countryside in, in, uh, in Poland, sit down and listen to their desires. What do they want you to do? If you can knock on the doors, go to some cafes or some bars and start a conversation with people, but go into that mood of listening rather than preaching. Uh, finally, in the last election in Norway, it was all about the environment. That was the totally dominating issue. We have three green parties. They lost. For the first time, green issues were top on the agenda and the green parties lost. Why? Because they had none of this attitude. They were preaching, running around telling people how to live their life, how to do, rather than looking into how can we frame green issues in a dialogue with people which resonates with the aspirations of the people out there. Most Norwegians are not living in Oslo city center. They're living in any number of small towns all over the country. And most Poles are not living in Warsaw. They're living all over this huge, beautiful country. Go out and speak to them. The power of listening, the power of uh, telling the right story, uh, the t power of compromise, all of the power of building trust, all of these were topics of today's conversation. We are not going to do the summing up now. We are going to do the summing up at lunchtime. Everybody is uh, uh, hungry at this stage. I would like to thank you. Uh, all the panelists were absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'd like to thank also Sofia, who has uh, been our right hand in organizing this conference. And uh, of course, uh, Jacek Rakowski, who appears always at the last moment, uh, <laughs> to thank him for, for uh, the possibility of speaking in this room and, and for, for your uh, hospitality in, in giving us the Palace of Science of Culture as the site of the deliberations about democratic innovations. Who would have thought about it 30 years ago? There you are. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, let us begin. So please uh, conclude your behind the scenes uh, chats. We are very happy that you have returned to our afternoon uh, panel. Uh, innovation in uh, democratic innovation in Poland, building a code of good practice. Let me introduce our excellent panelists. We expect that first the gentlemen will tell us a few words about what they think about uh, the uh, democratic innovations. Then we will have questions, so we will expect your activity. We have Kuba Wygnański, sociologist. Uh, the researcher of civic society fellowship of Yale University Stocznia Foundation or uh, uh, Shipyard Foundation Radosław Markowski uh, head of uh, election studies faculty in Polish Academy of Sciences uh, Professor Bartłomiej Nowotarski constitutional lawyer politologist Economic University in Wrocław and Hubert uh, Tadych European Democracy Youth Network. My name is Karolina Rewicka and I will have the pleasure of moderating this debate for you. We will start with presentations but by our speaker as the order was determined by the organizers. We start with Professor Batwomi Nowotarski. Please do keep your presentations to 10 minutes so that later we have more time for questions and discussions. Questions both from me and all our participants. Professor, the floor is yours. Please use the roster. Well, I will ask for your patience and 13 minutes. We're going back from the wide world to our post-communist backyard. Vladimir Matskevich, uh, philosopher currently in penal colony in Belarus, uh, is a pain that Belarus had so little time to build a civic society because, because Lukashenko was elected in 1994. And he said that the civic society should determine the directions for development of the country. Today, he prepares a very dramatic credo for civic society. He says, do not participate in evil. Do not participate in government events. Don't read government newspapers. Don't watch government TV. We had a bit more luck and time. Nonetheless, we did not bring our civic society as a project to a completion. Civic society is a partner for politics and representation of the communities they work with. I wrote that civic society is a project because I believe this is what it is. It's not just a dream of Alexis Tocqueville, uh, the researcher of civic society in America. Even in America, the uh, so civic society did not start blooming all of its own. It's not self-seeded. It needs nurturing. It must be nurtured from the politics side as well. It is a beautiful garden, but it does need looking after. Today we have the times of uncertainty and no challenges. I will not talk about all those things that we are worried about today, what, what we fear today. Behavioral psychology has adopted a concept of the threat to subjective social status. It's different than Max Weber's uh, objective social status. Because of a threat to subjective social status, 55% of white Americans are afraid. They feel threatened that they, they feel that they, uh, status is threatened because the status of women is growing. And for this reason, they have rejected their own constitutions in a referendum because the populists scared them that there would be a wave of immigration from Venezuela, from Cuba, that they would lose their places in hospitals, in schools, and so on. In Poland, approximately 40% adult Poles may feel threatened in their subjective status. Of course, uh, this mostly pertains to those less educated, lower middle class. These are our challenges. And such a social status quo 
is of course a fertile ground for somebody who will promise us better democracy. So I think the Poles are facing an alternative as well. Will we have in future a scared society rallying around the flag of some uh, owners uh, of some autocratic leaders and then even Peppa the Pig will look like you see here or do we continue to painstakingly build human capital, social capital of the Poles? We know that social capital is the grease for social development and we know what it is like in Poland 21% only 21% of Poles trust people other than their family and friends. 38%, 35% of business partners trust their partner in business. So this means every year we lose approximately 300 billion PLM because of transaction costs. 47% of contracts are breached, terminated before time because of lack of trust in business partners. An average Swede is a member of four NGOs. Poland, uh, Pol is a member of 0.4 NGO. And you must admit that since Solidarity, this fantastic experience, those NGOs became detached from their roots in any specific community. There are three drivers of social development. Individual capital of each one of us related to education and health. But there is also a social capital and cultural capital that allows us to cooperate, as well as institutions that are supposed to serve these two capitals. And in Poland, as, Pol as Professor Czapiński always said, we are still using just this one engine, just one driver. Out of 400,000 to 2.5 million, 65% women went to study at universities. But we have stopped, uh, we have stalled uh, in terms of developing social capital. What is important in this entire relationship, this cultural capital is supposed to exert pressure on institutional changes, on politicians. If this pressure does not happen, the lazy politicians will not create any inclusive or emancipatory institutions. And for all those years, we have been stuck in this supply democracy. I mean, the politicians were serving the institutions. We have, moreover, entered a more orthodox version of liberal representative democracy and the politicians always said, well, you elected us, so don't bother us now. So it is all about the lack of demand of the society for innovative institutions. 59% of people were actually withdrawn. 33% oh, were actually waiting for change and did not really get what they expected. I don't think that we have any choice. We have to go towards, lean towards demand-driven democracy. Nonetheless, the question is, who should be representing that demand? And when we went to Oslo in, uh, you know, in the NGO community, um, assertive civic civic society uh, organizations, you know, a um, SCO, assertive civic society organizations. Well, the point is that uh, Pol nonetheless it has to be said that Poles have an uh, allergy to becoming, to, to, to be active. So we have the passive and the active, and we also have to generate the demand pressure on politics. So we have two challenges continually facing us. As said before, these two weak links in our NGOs, given the liberal transformation, the um, partnership of the civic society with the politicians. We have our own experience. You do know, well, Kuba Wignański knows that after 2003, after the pro publica bono law was passed, 
it, t it changed a lot. Yes, it did. Nonetheless, even given what the Pro Publico Bono Council did, uh, it turned out to be um, a paper law. Nonetheless, in 1998, the uh, Bla Blair's government signed, signed the so-called English Compact, an example from a different country. That was a partnership-based agreement which ended up with the signing of a good practices code. They had a parliamentary debate in 1996, and then not only at the um, governmental level, but also at other levels, there were other issues. And everybody says that you, everybody said that you know there was a, a social uh, equity uh, and a an incentive for democratic governments. Um, in 1987, uh, Swedes actually went to uh, the, the UK and began implementing similar agreements. Actually, in Sweden, uh, you have approximately 200 permanent committees with a membership of politicians and NGOs, and do you everything from beginning till end, uh, public hearings and uh, professional consultations, and there is a, the law is actually the, um, the actual reference point, which is why they believe, they claim themselves to be lean because everything is de dealt with with the law. Whereas uh, Polish um, civic society organizations began providing services, that was due to a certain evolution. But why should we not represent those that we collaborate with? Such representation and representation skills may actually be a condition a sine qua non for being recognized in the political sphere and also a certain remedy for the overall cri crisis that we have been affected by uh, across the board. Uh, your 10 minutes are shortly up, Professor. OK, how do we represent? And how do we get legitimacy to represent? Traditional NGO representation, traditional representation of uh, NGO members, that, I believe, is a pathway to generating groups of interests. Nonetheless, I would like to mention two experiences Firstly, deliberative panels uh, from sortition. Uh, our guests have already been talking about it today. That is a legitimacy that has also been um, used in antiquity, not to mention the uh, juries. They're also selected that way. But going back to abroad, Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, only 17% of Brazilians are actually willing to do anything. The poor, not at all. 37% of Brazilian organizations only they have any kind of membership, and yet 80% began representing Brazilians, Brazilians in public life. Yes, they do have a participation-based constitution, which means that they actually participate via the so-called mediation capacity bestowed upon them by politicians. And then we have an, uh, another group that, do not, that does not join any kind of formal NGO relations at all. 60, 70 percent, in seven, to 70, 60, uh, 60, 70 percent, they actually support their own um, organizations. And possibly that is a proposal for polls unwilling to get themselves get engaged formally in any way uh, well if a deliberative panel um, agrees anything then possibly the um, their decisions ought to be adhered to so the future democracy can be standing on two representative legs um, the party machine on the one hand and NGOs on the other and then they would be enriched and enhanced Obviously, we will need innovative institutions in terms of uh, expressions and uh, means of expression and so on and so forth, and also communication between the NGO and community. Possibly, we are going to need a um, public law on this so on civic society and code of good practices, also in the area of pro publico bono. And let's follow the English. Let us try and awaken the dormant public potential and let us therefore renew the uh, mandate and legitimacy of our um, modern democracy. That was Professor Nowotarski. Now over to Radosław Markowski. 
please take your spot at the rostrum. That was really a very important motive. I haven't seen Sabo's uh, um, poll. 77% of Polish people approach the others with um, caution, which means that three quarters of us are actually uh, mistrustful of others. Now, that is also a question whether we are you know, in the middle of the way or have we not yet moved uh, from Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft. And the reason that there and whether we do not need a sense of empowerment, or is it actually there. But now over to Professor Radosław Markowski. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I was actually given 15% by organizers, and I would like to uh, decided to stick to the stereotype of an anarchic poll and uh, archaic poll and see that things can be done, but now I've been left with 10. Let me tell you that I'm going to start by talking about context. Um, deliberative innovation is something that on the one hand we have James Fish and his deliberative polls. I'm not going to be talking about that at all. On the other hand, we have the absolutely fantastic deliberative panels that have uh, been successful in Ireland and Cuba is doing them in Poland or organizing them in Poland. But I'm going to be talking about small local democratic initiatives uh, that are 10 or uh, have 10 or 20 members supported by expert opinions, supported by mediators and moderators uh, who make sure that uh, the um, Um, making sure that correct interests come to the surface. Now, how are we operating in Poland? We should focus on that. With all due respect to the deliberative panels, you need an addressee on the other side, people who will actually be listening and respectful of what panels are talking about. This is something of a political Teflon that is not going to accept the energy policy or the abortion policy or changes there too. This is why I would like to kick off by declaring that, you know, we, it's very easy to say that democracy is in crisis now. It's always been in crisis, right? And it has always been evolving. Today we believe that it is in crisis because we have, we have had the extraordinarily, extraordinarily um, unusual moment. But now we are revisiting certain global standards. And... The, we have not managed a, the, the fundamental recipe of going back to direct democracy. Our roots, uh, as an academic teacher, I could go on for hours about uh, everything that's wrong with direct uh, democracy. We have done experiments and uh, uh, research. Well, Max Weber was absolutely right that it is, can be successful in small communities. It can be successful uh, anywhere where we have the meritocratic minimum or where it is absent or present. I mean, of course, uh, I'm addressing this to our guests from abroad, you're in a country where 90% of people in the polls say that they want a referendum, but when the referendum is organized, uh, it fails because the people don't come. Only one referendum was successful because it was spread over two days. So that's one thing. The second thing is that I am uh, an empirical researcher of contextual uh, aspects on individual level. And modern politology is going further and further towards controlling all linkages via context. There is this excellent dictionary of contextual variables where the first chapter starts with the, easy, with the shortest sentence ever. It depends. Well, it does. And uh, how it depends, recently one of Professor's ministers said that he is sick and tired of experts who come to him and tell him it depends. But it's not a stupid answer at all, considering uh, that the expert can say what it depends on. This is the great uh, shortage. So the current Polish situation is not a, a situation of whatever. I mean, you are in a lawless country. That's the brutal truth. 
it used to, particip to, to pertain to what is in the package of the rule of law. But now our country is dismantling even the very primitive uh, democratic procedures. And for this reason, hence the longish introduction, I believe that if in the autumn of this year this uh, rule would be continued and maintained, the only reasonable thing we can to do is go down to the local level and on the local level try to decide where to locate a landfill, whether a contaminated lake should be treated in this way or another way, because this, uh, of these authorities, this government simply does not listen to anything. Well, maybe somebody will counter what I say, but... So anyway, local authorities. And we also have to remember that where, as in Mexico, the local authorities where the institutional party did not listen to its citizens for over a year, uh, for, sorry, for over a century, and just kept buying their votes, the Zapatas for uh, decades have had deliberative democracy. They have hundreds and thousands of hectares of land where they farm, where they uh, practice what is considered civilized democracy in Europe. It is an alternative and radical society and it is against the government. I mentioned that uh, to make it, to emphasize that radical actions are also within our purview. We don't always have to, you know, act like we're civilized democratic European. We can take much more radical actions as well. So this is shortly. Uh, another thing is uh, citizens' consensus conferences, Anglo-Saxons traditions. It's called citizens' juries in Germany. Those are the planning cells. The whole point is that those undertakings are usually initiated by local authorities, but not necessarily also by citizens. Their function is to solve a simple problem where two parties that are arguing about this lake or this landfill come invited by a moderator with some ra uh, 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 randomly selected citizens deliberate what can be done better for this lake. It is a very wise thing. Uh, media are not allowed in the room until the whole thing is resolved. The people know what Homo sapiens is, and once the camera starts, the Homo sapiens starts acting silly and saying silly things. The media only come in after the panel is over, and they are informed about what has been decided. So the objective of it is, of course, to expand inclusivity and quality of the delib deliberation itself based on knowledge and not anybody's uh, suggestion. So development of civicness as a part of democracy and legitimizing decisions. Please remember that if those people eventually achieve consensus between solutions A and B, there were people who were in favor of A and in favor of B, but after a few days, once they leave, leave this deliberative event, those who quote-unquote lost must explain to other citizens why, why they have chosen to go away uh, from, uh, to, to depart from their initial views. And the only way they can do that is by uh, academic expertise. So the role of the moderator is paramount because it's the moderator who selects the experts, of course, in consultation with others, selects the materials that are to be used. But the very essence of those deliberative uh, undertakings in small communities, the point of it is to reach a consensus. The Danish especially emphasize that. Why is it important for everybody to agree? Because the argumentation is, of course, we can get together and have a chat, but that's just a discussion club where eventually we have a 60-40 vote. The important thing is to stimulate ultimate political decision because a politician 
cannot say that at the end of the day, you know, we talked and talked and, you know, I would, in 60% I would do this and in 40% I would do something else. Now, experts, acad uh, academics, scientists, what do we know? We know that things change in science, that there are different kinds of experts, but of course this is the role of the moder moderator, the initiator, to select neutral experts, not lobbyists, and so on and so forth. So the heart of this process, the true deliberativeness that should be taking place there, it should be based on equal, uncontrolled, competent, free from power seduction environment. There are many fundamental delineators of how such deliberations should be conducted. The participants must be told from the very beginning that there are, and this is the assumption number one, there are no ideal solutions. Everyone must be adopted to the local conditions. Assumption number two, there are powerful forces that are uh, against this or other solution, and you should know that. One, uh, then we should generate the concepts of initiatives and not specifics, and we have to present an objective that is incredibly clear and understandable in the language of the participants and not the eggheads. Proposals for change should be flexible, implementation should be learning by action. So this pertains to those assumptions. Yes, yes, I can see the way you're looking at me. I'm wrapping up. So the main principles, neutrality. Let me emphasize it again. 20 years ago, I talked to Professor Regulski. He was convincing me to do something like this in Poland. And we went, you know, to the country. And I saw it in the eyes of local communities, how they would be bringing down their political opponents thanks to this. And I have withdrawn from that because I decided that we cannot compromise such excellent ideas. So first and foremost, neutrality. No single political option should benefit from it. The second very important thing is feasibility. You should only, and we're back to Weber with his meritocracy, you can only do things that are within your competences. Such deliberations cannot resolve matters that are not within their um, uh, purview. It's like a referendum. You can't ask questions uh, that cannot be answered. Uh, like Orban had a number of these referendums. You know, he asked people about the things that they, that they had absolutely no influence over. And ultimately, uh, these must be implementable. And up front, it must be agreed what is the status of the ultimate decision, be it cons uh, full consensus or not. Is the authority obligated to implement it, or was it just an interesting extended social consultation that will be just remembered by local journalists? So this is in a nutshell. I mean, I still have several pages left. Oh, Professor, we are not done. Uh, Professor Markowski, certainly there will be time to get back to some of the issues. One very important uh, topic that needs expanding, the role of elites. So Kuba Wignański, his introductory remarks, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. We are in a hurry. I am aware, but please let me know how I should position the microphone. My name is Kuba Wignański and I'm a bit of a mix. I'm partially a researcher, uh, but also a practitioner and I'm not alone because I am a, a part of many groups and organizations. We have people from Stocznia Foundation here, Maria Ignaciak, Mar Marta Perchuć and others. Uh, and they are truly the heroes because they participated in those actions that some of you have uh, perceived with disbelief. Even our guest from Belgium has noticed that we have done something in Poland. It was difficult, but we uh, prevailed. We have uh, provided handouts in Polish and English so that you can see that
you know, there are things, things can be done. I'm today in uh, things can be done mood. I welcome the first panel. It was very interesting because we found out some things that are far from obvious to many people, that the democracy does have an alternative, that history did not end, it actually accelerated. And possibly every uh, generation must go through its own version of fascism. And maybe it is not true that history teaches us anything. And I would uh, say that, you know, it's, it's like a Lazorek uh, approach. If things are bad, it means it's going to be good. And the cycle is eternal in a way. It's a historical cycle. So there is something that we are dealing for with the first time, not the end of history, but the end of time. And these two elements, you know, this running in circles and uh, recurrences are underpinned by something more dramatic, more liminal, and uh, this increases the emotional uh, aspect of the conversation. Whether democracy would save us or destroy us is not clear. It does not uh, guarantee greater economic efficiency as we have many uh, examples of and it does not guarantee peace I mean you could use quotations about democracy you can write a book of them we can believe that democracy is a pacifistic manner of finding consensus and so on but we have to remember that the most recent century does not give us any proof that democracy protects us from war democracy results in war and death and it has been so since Sparta and Athens. Democracy and populism are not opposed to each other and many would see a populist verdict as the very essence of democracy. Democracies can be totalitarian, they can self-harm, they can commit suicide. They are not given forever. The entire process including our joining the European Union and meeting the Copenhagen criteria who could have been so naive to believe that this is something that is given once and forever. It is a mechanism that needs watering and nurturing. It has, it needs care. Those who base it, their activities on telling people things they want to hear and not the things they need to hear, uh, it commits a suicide because people don't believe that there are things greater than themselves. We know such democracies where we do not care about anything uh, other than ourselves. I mean, a long time ago, I would think, uh, not so long ago, I would think that comparison to Weimar Republic that turned into Third Reich. We met in Poznań recently, you know, remember this philosopher in uh, pants and said, maybe it's just that Heidegger's authentism, that's what we are. And this happened today, ignoring the categories of uh, roots and uh, Ignoring the need for the roots, especially in uncertain times, it is naivete, and this is not how you win elections. And what Eric said is very interesting. I've been riding a motorcycle for 30 years. I don't know if you know what a counter turn is. In general, if you want to turn left, you have to turn the steering wheel to the right, because otherwise the motorcycle will fall. You have to do something that is completely counterintuitive. And this is very counterintuitive. So today I would like to give this, uh, I mean, the interesting lecture on being counterintuitive. So sometimes I'm not sure myself whether we should defend democracy or run from it. And here I get to the essence of our meeting. Maybe it, it does not have a specific adjective, but it can look differently. Hence, we look at innovations. Some of them are retro innovations. The idea of citizens that you get the mandate either through winning elections or through 
uh, ballot, uh, sorry, by uh, drawing, uh, sortition. It's not a new idea. I mean, Socrates died like that. The oldest functioning republics until Napoleon put his family on all the thrones, those were based on uh, drawing lots for various reasons, anti-corruption, preventing violence, lots of reasons, but it is uh, not a new method by any means. Well, I probably only have five minutes left. I didn't look at the watch. Well, you've started at 14.04, so does it mean that I should finish? No, I still have a moment, yes, okay. So I think there is no disagreement between me and Radek, whether it is central or, or local. We have to just fortify it and practice it on every level. One uh, of the most progressive experiments are t currently taken on the level of European Union, because if I remember correctly, European Union uh, has decided that uh, there would be a pan-European panel three times a year. And this year it was on wasting food. In the State of the Union every year, the chairperson must refer to the verdict of the citizens. Probably not all of you are familiar with this tradition, but the synod reform is about the same thing, that we must listen to each other, that institutions which were built as hierarchical institutions are going to rot. They will become sclerotic unless they catch something grassroot level. The we are speaking in a specific moment because elections are coming soon and many of us are thinking how to win these elections. You know, in English you say vote and voice. Politi politicians want our vote, but we want our voice. And democracy it does not happen only during the elections. It also happens in between the days, hours, months, the local events in which we want to have uh, voice the need for agency. It is a fairly well-known argument, especially in the United States. In this first first time I participated, it was with Professor Fishkin in the United States. In the US, people don't go to elections, uh, just like in Poland. They just don't believe in um, representative democracy. But the ability to vote gives one an incredible privilege, or rather mandate, that nobody asks them who they voted or even if they voted. So from the perspective of a democratic doctrine that talks about a perfect citizen, a person that has enough time, knowledge and ability to talk, to develop an opinion on what is good, not only for me, but what is public good, this is a miracle that must happen. And even after the first panel, this group stops being representative statistically because they come to this panel as consumers. They say, what have you got for me? Because that's how they think about politics. But these 100 people, you will see here uh, the description. This 100 people is really Poland in a nutshell. And these people have worked because we only talked about uh, drawing lots. But the miracle that is happening is that these people, after we recruit them, and it's difficult, our colleague from Belgium said you called a lot of people. Well, frankly, if I knew that we would have to call 113,000 people to recruit 100 that would truly be representative for Poland, I don't know if we would have decided to do it at all, but we did. So first, these people for an entire weekend listened to experts. It was about energy poverty. I'm not going to talk about that, but it's important as it is a topic that pertains to many of us. And the first element of this magic sauce is that people get access to knowledge. Because we talked about that, like Radek said, somebody stands up, opens a window, and he's supposed to have competences. No, people have a rational ignorance. You know, they pay their taxes and they uh, maintain their politicians so that somebody else would be dealing with all those problems. So, you know, 
there are things that can be deliberated. Of course, not a specific model of a um, helicopter, because that people will never learn. But all things that relate to the sense of fairness, if we believe democracy in democracy at all, this is something that people derive from themselves as the sense of fairness, the sense of justice and bearing burdens. And a civic panel is the only instrument that I know. There are politicians, there are experts and so on. Those are the groups that are, of course, all courting each other because they need each other, but they structurally hate each other. So let me just say that this panel, the first moment at such a panel is education. People get knowledge. The second weekend is deliberative and it's very important because without moderators, people in small groups permutated with moderators and they discuss various solutions adding their own. There were over 100 of those and ultimately at the end they vote. Now I will bypass a few pages to get to the question what next? Because this is a question that needs to be asked. There are certainly politicians that would say whether well, it is Polish experiment and it was the third bottom-up panel that I'm aware of in Europe. First the G1000 in Belgium. It also started with anger and rebellion and incompetence of the government structures that were supposed to work with that. And the Irish experiment. It also started with the rebellion of the professors and activists, the first panel that led to the uh, constitutional amendment. So what may happen next? Admittedly, after this panel, and I would like to add one thing that is very important because it differentiates the Polish panel from the others, and Radek is going to like it. We call it a civic council. It has one more component where people in various places in Poland sit at the table and talk or not talk. Those are self-selected. So it is a mixture of the distributed conversation model that was the case in case of the strike of teachers. Four and a half thousand people, teachers, children, parents, sat down and talked, and it was transformative. So these people started as consumers, but ended up with a verdict that could put many politicians to shame, because we had to explain the theory of justice of roles to them, in other words, using the example of board games. But the whole point was that what I I'm coming up with is not supposed to serve only myself. So it's a good thing that elections are coming because we could convince our parliamentarians to have such a panel similar as uh, in Ireland, to make it a part of Polish legislative procedure. Two parties have it currently in their program. We hope that maybe others would uh, also adopted. We would like, uh, we hope that it would not be the thing that would differentiate the opposition parties. You see, it is a Churchill moment, but we have no Churchill. We have to tell the people that things are going to get worse and things are going to be difficult. We'll see if it works. Poland is not 200 years behind Norway. We are like a cicada. We come up in very unexpected moments. For example, the first constitution in Europe, nobody understand how the children of Saxon uh, nobles could come up with something like this. Please uh, do wrap up. Uh, yes, my final sentence. The civic panels are present in a number of cities in Poland. There are many procedures I think we have learned in Poland, uh, but in a week or two weeks in Bydgoszcz, there would be a 12th forum for of participation practitioners. There will be 200, 300 people who practice locally. So let's hope 
Let's keep fingers crossed and hopefully we would surprise everybody once again. Uh, thank you very much. Hubert Tadych is the last person to take the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation. My role today is to confront the theoretical underpinnings that uh, the previous speakers have presented with the experience of people born after 1989. And having several years experience in NGO activity myself, both social and political activities. As I thought about this panel, it came to my mind to present to you the four main problems, the four main topics that I have identified on the path uh, towards full implementation, full engagement of young people, the 20, 30 years old, uh, becoming fully engaged in direct democracy. via the NGOs. So the first problem, given the experience of my peers from Central European states, the Balkans, the Caucasus country, countries, as the organization that I represent includes such strong individualities, the first problem is inheriting an attitude of low civic awareness. Such inheritance, visible especially in our part of Europe, in general stems from low awareness of our parents, our grandparents, about what joint efforts can achieve and how they can impact the reality around us. So while in Poland we see that on a national level, on the level of higher activity such as participation in elections, this awareness is on a satisfactory level, on a local neighborhood level it is negligible compared to Western Europe. I could give you a lot of examples when really shaping the infra local infrastructure, education, uh, places to raise children together. It is left almost entirely in the hands of uh, local governments that are elected every four or five years. And uh, knowledge of young people that they can have some influence over these five years is very low. What does it stem from? Well, mostly from very low quality of local media that were additionally politicized over the recent years and a poor level of organization of the neighborhood communities, be it on the level of the assembly, the uh, village or an estate. The next problem is the opportunism of young people. It's very hard for me to say that among the people who today are the core of social and political activity, the vast majority are people who have uh, reached maturity over the past eight years, which means that in 2015 some of them were 10 years old. So their social awareness then was very low. Things that happened over the past eight years have led to extreme opportunism because everybody knows that uh, for uh, social activism you need both financial resources and human capital. It is very difficult for me to say that many of the representatives of my generation see this dependence on funds and grants they can receive from organizations that are that have direct ties with the authorities uh, that have only one point of view at democracy and the future and so on has a significant impact on the fact that these organizations have become opportunistic and they are now sh shaping their messages in line with what their grant donors want to hear. The next level is the low, uh, the next issue is the low level of civic awareness. Over the past 30 years, 
the matters of civic awareness, awareness of a citizens' rights and obligations among the Poles as well as the self-government in schools and on the level of both primary and secondary education are largely omitted. Those are considered less important. So in long term, they uh, foster low levels of civic awareness. This coincides with the attempts to limit the influence of NGOs over education and providing knowledge to young people. And social resistance is just a few percent, scant few percent of parents and children uh, of school age. The fourth problem is the far underappreciated role of internet and artificial intelligence. Here I can say with a great conviction that as I look at the activities of many organizations who rep whose representatives are actually present today, uh, first and foremost we see two aspects. Underappreciating the fact that the activity moved to the internet over the past years and it had a permanent long-term impact on the attitudes of 20 and 30 years old who want to express their rebellion against what is happening in Poland and worldwide. And the most glaring example would probably be the way the young people engage with the march of June 4th that will happen in two days. Um, actually, um, most of my peers have decided to take a good look at the march uh, from um, beer gardens, whereas their parents and grandparents are going to actually be part of the march. And now the other aspect that comes to mind is the growing misinformation problem. Since 2022, 2021, excuse me, we have had uh, completely new tools arrive, which have obviously affected the NGOs, but it has been underestimated as well. Uh, the deep fakes have uh, are abundant. I believe that over the next election campaigns in Poland and um, in Europe, deep fakes are really going to be very important. We are not prepared for it. Poland is a uh, well, we are chasing the rabbit, I believe, here. Uh, as a country, the European Union uh, have come, has come up with initiatives that designed to reduce the impact of uh, social media on uh, the general reality. Nonetheless, I believe that some political forces consider it quite beneficial, what's going on. Seven main postulates could be tabled in that context. The seven main postulates could definitely remain within the realm of the good practices code uh, that we um, discussed before. Promoting innovation, the promoting of the use of state-of-the-art digital tools, as I have said, their role is underestimated. Fostering civic education, among others, by greater involvement in extracurricular activities for obvious reasons, for well-known reasons. It is becoming increasingly, Im increasingly impossible in organized education, not to mention the fact that we should be organizing um, awareness campaigns. Nonetheless, that is also a problem because of the internal clashes. We need to also focus on information awareness and disinformation, as well as misinformation. We ought to educate young people and prevent the acceptance of fakes and deep fakes. We should have been expanding our society to include different social groups in terms of uh, assuring equally equality-based approach in terms of age, orientation and uh, origin, or social origin, I understand. I think that we are 
much too often inclined to focus on selected social groups so other, while others remain underrepresented. Not to mention evaluation. I believe that Poland has lost her culture evaluation. Even if we do evaluate, um, which means that uh, only if we continue evaluating can we uh, guarantee that our organizations are going to be working uh, to increasingly good quality. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, brings our interventions to an end. But now the time has come for a Q&A session. I have been asked to pick uh, those who can be particularly valuable. Uh, Róża Rzeplińska and Jacek Kasprzak. Uh, Róża Rzeplińska, the uh, I have the right to know service. Would you please care to comment and offer some of your, your own reflections? Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Now, what can I add to the discussion? What can I add to the debate that was really interesting? The only thing that I can say is that for the past seven or eight years, it is a reason of great concern that our parliament is dead. I'm going to try and tell you what it means. Well, thanks to the fact of its death, we can try to implement a number of uh, concepts. It, ha it is now dead because uh, it has lost its legislative function. Deputies are not inviting the society to join the legislative process. Those who want to work on new acts of law cannot do that because, for example, draft laws are not numbered properly. And that is to a certain extent or in a certain sense dramatic. Why? Because that means that over the last seven years, the 600 deputies of both terms of office have not exercised parliamentary debate, have not practiced um, parliamentary debate, which obviously affects those who are defavorized uh, or defavored and those who are in power. We could try and introduce some changes in view of what the civic society has done over the last six, uh, seven or eight years. While pushed back onto the back burner, while deprived of a voice, deprived of a space for speaking out in terms of influencing the power, well, the civic society has actually done its job. We do have proof of certain communities and environments having come up with uh, political proposals. That specifically goes for education, but also climate and energy, but, uh, well, civic rights, to put things bluntly. Now, since we do have uh, our proposals therein as citizens, we can do what, uh, whatever we can in terms of what Cuba told us. On the one hand, the parliament has lost its capacity for organizing debate, but on the other hand, we have actually been hearing very strong voices in terms of key areas of policy that we can directly affect. Well, if um, power changes hands in October, that may be an opportunity for us to work in a different way. Maybe we can try and develop the um, relationship between citizens capable of defining what is important for them and translate them into legislation on the one hand and uh, deputies on the other, and deputies who have lost their operational model. And hopefully, deputies will be able to find out uh, or to conclude that citizens ought to be allowed into the debate. Some of you, you might know it, others might not. How, is, how does our same operate? Uh, during the post-pandemic uh, period, journalists have stopped coming to parliamentary committees. Um, journalists are, you know, pushed pushed back to into a small corner on the gallery, with no access to daily debates. That also concerns regular citizens. 
their entry to the parliament, to, to the parliament, parliamentary buildings is very much restricted. Not to mention the fact that the speaker of the same, of the lo lower house of the parliament, uh, actually does not want certain persons to be given passes at all. Does that affect us? Obviously it does, because it means that while we are fed by legislation from that parliament, we are not given our own space to speak out. What would I like to happen? I would want these experiences of the last eight years to change something. Why? Because we have had determination over the last eight years to work in our individual teams, and I hope that we are going to be able to dra graft that experience onto the parliamentary community. Thank you very much. That was Roja Rzeplinska. Yes, we have had a crisis of uh, citizen-based or civic democracy as uh, evidenced by the so-called silent same. Pavel Kasprzak, the citizens of RP or Obywatele RP. I am one of those who uh, would be allowed on to, uh, in, onto the same premises. They would have to do it in the boot of a car or by um, physically jumping over the obstacle barriers that have been put up. I am definitely a persona non grata. I believe that the crisis of Polish democracy that requires a quest for innovation is much deeper and much older than the current reign of law and justice. We have to uh, absolutely understand that this crisis is exactly what has led to the, these particular people taking power or seizing power. I believe that the current situation has arisen from the shortage rather than surplus of democracy. I would like to tie that claim uh, with uh, the claim that democracy is uh, not necessarily the full recipe. Democracy shortages have definitely taken form in the form of the crisis that now we are struggling against. Since we have an international community here, I think this ought to be a message in the bottle from Poland to other democracies. In a sense, we know more about democracy than they do, albeit being a younger democracy and our social capital is more limited. Nonetheless, we do know that democracies tend to die out, and we, we also know what the source of the phenomenon is. What is going on in Poland is also observable in others. I would like to mention a number of components, including deficits in very classic areas of democracy. Crisis of uh, authority in Poland is perceived mainly through the crisis in the judiciary. And nonetheless, the executive um, power has never been controlled ever by the legislative uh, um, branch. Europe does not know it. Obviously, that does not apply to the states because they have a di different system. But let me go back to what David said. Um, a civic panel with a sample of 100 individuals does not e increase the number of citizens joining the democratic processes. Um, it is actually a legible and visible proof of what is going on. Whereas uh, in terms of the government, well, we have the government and the opposition, and we have persons who are aspire to be in power. In the classical democratic sense, we do not, there is, we do not have anybody there who would actually um, be, become a system of checks and balances for the uh, government. Actually, um, nothing about us without us principle has stopped working in Poland. So I was really interested in what David was talking about uh, in terms of civic 
panels, citizen panels, because that is actually part of the attempt of restoring the classic tripartition of uh, power. Rosa Rzeplinska has just been talking about the pathologies of a completely dysfunctional parliament. Nonetheless, we have to understand that the parliament is the political, currently the political backup of the ruling majority. Moreover, the law has also changed its function. Its function. It has stopped being a set of rules that nobody sh- should transcend. It is a set of, it is rather, it has become rather a set of presidential ordinances and not, and not much more. So I believe that we ought to go back to the basics, both in Poland and in Europe, uh, that is unaware of the sword hanging or looming above their heads. I think that we should go back to the basics, law, tripartition of power, and so on and so forth. Poland has many more problems that it suffers of. I am absolutely certain that such problems could also be listed for other democratic European states, and this also means that Poland ought to be, be and become a much more uh, interesting place to observe. I would like to emphasize that the um, we, the uh, citizens of the Republic of Poland, of the Vatel RP, has always has it ha, has had it has always had it in its program to restore the third chamber, the third house. David was talking about the citizen was discussing citizen panels as operational as opposed to other formats. Nonetheless, I would really be against I would really be wary about uh, advertising such forms in this way. Citizens' assemblies are simply a response to uh, challenges awaiting democracy. And they have, they take on double forms. Um, People who make decisions concerning abortion, like in Ireland, or energy costs, like in Poland, they do know that they are not going to be running for the next election, so they are not following politics as we know it. Let us um, let us mention, suffice to mention, Emmanuel Macron and his retirement or retirement pension reform. And uh, whenever a difficult situation arises, uh, then uh, Whenever a difficult situation arises, such as, for example, a climate craze crisis, what happens is that we resort to measures known from catastrophic movies, such as, for example, Jaws or Blue Tap, more, more recent. Nothing else is possible. Not to mention demographics. We are living in aging societies. Even Poland now has more uh, senior citizens than junior citizens. Not to mention the fact that psychosocially, uh, it has to be claimed that the older go to uh, the polls and uh, younger citizens really don't. Now, we obviously have the shortness of blanket, of the financial blanket. Whenever it comes to the question, what should we spend our money on, education or or uh, senior citizens, well, the senior citizens will always obviously uh, outvote the young, and which is also para- quite kind of a paradox because the young are working their butts off to support senior citizens. And this is when, and this is why participative um, democracy may not be the answer. And a de- deliberative democracy could be a, could be a uh, solution. Now, to conclude the uh, state of the condition of Polish of Polish approach, well, Kuba is an optimist. I am a depressive pessimist, and I am living proof. Uh, I'm, so, for example, a living proof of a frustrated uh, Senate uh, can- candidate to the Senate who also knows that. So if we come up with the postulate, um, um, of confronting a senatorial candidate, whatever wherever there's peace, there should be a different candidate. So we we have four major parties. So possibly we should have four candidates and listen to them in debate, um, or if, or at least in public hearing, and 
We should only then decide who of the four are the best. Such postulates are not supported by politicians, which is obvious, uh, but sadly it is not supported by the uh, voters either. We are the only ones um, who see that as, a, as any kind of va value, uh, even not the media. And I believe that this is the you know kind of doom and gloom that we are now in. Pavel Kaspar, uh, thank you very much for that. Now we are off with the Q&A session. Mm, obviously, uh, raise your arm, introduce yourselves, and please tell us whom you want to address the question with. We have the first question. Is the mic out there? Do we have another mic out there? Or uh, we have to use the microphone. I'm sorry, but we, then we cannot translate if we don't hear the question. My name is Elżbieta Czykwin, Christian Academy, uh, Theological Academy, Professor of Sociology. My question is to Professor Markowski. I am a witness. I have witnessed several um, election campaigns for the parliament. I would like to ask, uh, Professor, have you tried to look into how the elect lists for elections are prepared because i think democracy is uh, being uh, breached there in a very obvious way that i find very emotional it is usually happening behind the scenes among the parties and you know even now it is coming through and we know that for example it was the chairman who decides what the list is going to be and so forth I know the cases when a businessman in Podlasie paid one million PLN to be on the first spot on the list. I know cases that um, sympathies of, say, women uh, in whom the list setters were interested romantically were put on the list. So I do believe this is the area where our democracy is limping, so to say. And a second question, what would you say, Professor, if the lists were round, if they were shaped like a circle, and in the circle, names of the candidates were placed radially, alphabetically, there would be no first or second place. As you know, now there is a struggle on who is going to be first or second or third place. And it is clear that if we have two large parties, the most important ones, and in, say, Podlasie, we have five or seven places for one party, seven or eight for the other party, somebody who will be on a first or second place doesn't have to lose any sleep. They will almost certainly be elected, regardless of whether they uh, proved themselves worthy during their first uh, term or not. So what would you say if it were not, if it were circles and not square uh, election cards? Thank you for this question. I will respond with a mix of what the science says about that and how I consulted, you know, the uh, Congress of Women to achieve this famous zip, the, the um, equal number of men and women. Well, I have been criticizing the society more than the politicians for the past few years because the things that are happening in Poland are, we are to take credit or blame for it. We allow them to do that. Electoral lists in Poland are open. Nobody forces anybody to vote for first, second, or third. It's not a closed list. So if the lists are open, there are two conclusions possible. When the Women's Congress asked me how to do it and they wanted to be in the same number on the list as men, I showed them how to do that. The question was, do you want more women on the lists or do you want more women in the parliament? 
Because if you want more women in a parliament where the political culture is, well, more men-oriented, the vote of women would have to accumulate for women and not be uh, dispersed for many women. So I said that on every list there should be only as many women. It is us, people, who come to these politicians and say, OK, here, here we have an athlete, a celebrity, a writer who is so popular that she would get at least 30,000 votes. So the party people say, OK, let's take this writer, Hannah, we put her on place eight, she'll get us 30,000 votes and we will bolster the uh, seats number one, two and three. Well, it doesn't work in many countries. What we need most and what we don't have is mobilization. I can't hear that after the elections, uh, you know, the citizens come and scream, once again, the ones and twos and threes have won. And I, say, I, I want to say, well, who was forcing your hand? Because in case of some parties, there are 200 people on the list. I mean, given the negative selection of candidates, you can find one decent person. But what do you need to do? You need to read up on them, take interest, and so on. And what is the level of awareness? It is the same as in American research. If you asked the third league team, KS Womianki, uh, people from Womianki will name them. But if you ask about the four, five justices of uh, Supreme Court, nobody in Poland knows. So really, the ball is in the society's court because it's the matter of mobilizing various groups that would force the parties to bet on people who are recognizable and worth putting on the lists. And of course, numbers are important. I mean, a circle, it's, it's certainly uh, a sur perception psychologist would probably tell us that what is up and or down in a circle would also matter. But, you know, if it's not to be a circle, I think that, you know, in the day of computers, we can simply put the names on the list in random order just like we rotate a political party so that the first one is not the obvious choice. So yes, the technical element could matter as well. Well, I can't imagine that the chairman of a party that would come with signatures of 50,000 people, elected by the people of the given uh, community, of course, every party chairman would place her, whether it would be position one or position two, doesn't matter. But we have to remember that we have, an, we have open election lists. You can't vote for a party without indicating the person that you are voting for. So these lists are not closed. Next question. Tomek Kozłowski, once again, just a brief comment inspired by this fantastic debate. First, something that was not mentioned here, but should be lobbying. I believe that what is happening in modern Western democracies, including the participatory democracy, this happened through lobbying, through its uh, legal and social civilizing. And the second thing is what my colleague said, uh, the empowerment and civic awareness. In communist Poland, we had two entities, party on one hand, the Catholic Church on the other. What is happening after that many years uh, of uh, no Poland? Same thing. So, you know, if you think deeper about that, it really sends shivers down your spine. Uh, the emptiness of uh, uh, total vacuum of uh, political philosophy and so on. What Kuba said, no, sorry, Pavel first, maybe. Uh, the absence of uh, the division of powers and absence of earlier democracy. I'm a foundation, founda uh, founder of the Taxpayers' Rights Foundation because the court application of tax law 
in Poland is still outrageous. I have uh, said and published this uh, sentence a number of times. If we only improved this one thing in the Republic of Poland, we would be living in a different country. And this is a completely thing, a different thing uh, than uh, the uh, division of powers. And look, the Supreme Administrative Court is the only court that peace did not touch. It is not uh, often talked about, and the media also don't uh, highlight it often. I always listen with great enthusiasm to what Professor Markovsky says. I just wanted to remind uh, you about Professor Kulesha, whom I knew, and his idea fix was that a municipality is a legal person. He always kept saying, listen, every municipality may sign an agreement with Honolulu or Singapore, and that's what I'm thinking about, this potential. We do have an excellent self-government movement in Poland and so on, but it's something that you can not only touch, but something that you need to develop and remember that it exists. And uh, as for Cuba and optimism, the uh, lawyer's view Borders of states are more and more often transcended in the modern world. I mean, people are moving cross borders, goods are moving, and so on. But civil law and economic law, that has transcended uh, borders of the states even in medieval times. And today, uh, the states are secondary when compared to the uh, economic turnover. Of course, it is a dirty turnover, right? Multinational corporations, global global companies and so on. But since we are here in the international community, we can do it the same way. I mean, we can create a civic network in an international context, not just European. Say climate, majority of issues that we talked about, poverty, migration and so on, all those topics are transborder, really. So this is my appeal to you citizens of all countries unite. Would anybody like to respond to these words? Well, maybe just uh, one sentence, because when this meeting was planned, I'm sorry that I'm taking the floor again, but I just wanted to say that I wanted to talk about innovations. I've been dealing with Anthropocene for the past five years. Soon, all those democracies in 20 years, if we don't do anything, we'll just burn down democracy or not. But the third house, I would maybe argue with Cuba for a bit here, if we were to plan, maybe it should be the house of the young for long term with veto power with regard to first and second house on matters concerning nature. As it happens in New Zealand now, Jacek Żakowski told me that you would laugh me out of the room if I start talking about it, but as usually, New Zealand is very innovative, India and so on. Rivers and lakes have legal personality. You can go and defend their essence, not because they serve this horrible species better or worse, but because they have autotelic value. The autotelic value of rivers is codified in in New Zealand, it's the Maoris who take care of it. But if we talk about democratic innovations, we should include this matter that democracy must start defending nature. Well, maybe Jacek Żakowski will laugh you out, out of the room, but in Poland, we have, uh, from the fund by name of Henrik Wujec, we have supported somebody who is the advocate of giving legal personality to Odra. It may seem like an idea out of an outer space, but if Gmina, if a municipality may have uh, a legal personality, why not Odra? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the time for this panel is running out, Kuba. Uh, our panelists, uh, were with us. Now we invite you to a 10 minutes coffee break. At 3.10 we have the next panel, discussion of Jacek Żakowski with politicians and representatives of NGOs. Thank you very much.
gathered uh, from uh, well since this morning. I am deeply grateful for that. Carolina Dresser Smalets, the um, chairman of the OFOP. Trade Union's organizations, Paulina Kieszkowska, free courts. Uh, Mayor of Warsaw, Rafał Krzaszkowski. Kuba Karyś has just spoken. Adam Bodna has also joined us, uh, the uh, lawyer and uh, doctor of uh, legal sciences and former ombudsman. We have also been joined by Michał Koboska, journalist, political activist, 20, 50 um, political party activist and uh, Mr. Zandberg um, of the Polish Parliament and also a doctor of the sociological sciences. Now we are to focus on a round table format. Everybody is in a good mood here and which is great. Now the situation is as follows. In 2015, power changed hands, authoritarian powers of unknown providences attacked Poland. Political parties who um, were then at the in parliament uh, took up a desperate battle, a desperate struggle. Nonetheless, this really proved very, very difficult or actually well nigh impossible. Civic society burst forth practically overnight. Local and specialist initiatives were organized. Free courts, a very specialist uh, initiative and one of key importance at that. Uh, but the uh, Committee for the Protection of Democracy. It was the first time that such movement actually burst forth since 1989 on such scale. It was hugely impressive, not to mention the fact that it definitely stopped the process of um, authori authorizing Poland uh, Chairman Kaczynski uh, claims that he began changing the Polish political system. Unfortunately, he is right, but fortunately, he did not finish the job. NGOs stood ground, um, gave resi and and began resisting. You, we do remember the marches and the pickets before the. Uh, constitutional court premises. Well, uh, then the parties got themselves together. And they began organizing themselves, and they began organizing people, all fine and dandy. Uh, but the point is that they uh, began organizing themselves self-sufficiently. The civic society that used to be the uh, king of Polish politics between 2015 and 2019 uh, well, was pushed to the uh, second, to the back, or even the uh, um, back, back burner. And now here we are on the threshold of uh, June the 4th. It's great that we are all going to be marching together. That is really great. Nonetheless, how do we do it? That is a question to all of you. And that is also the assignment for this panel. We have to respond to the following question. How would we do it in order to preserve the structural power of political parties who have definitely gone through a renaissance and are unquestionably stronger than five years ago, in order to preserve democracy? Political parties have gone on winning and will be winning um, elections, and they are going then to appoint their officials. But we don't want them to be isolated. They, they need to be supported by civic society well-organized, 
aware of what's going on and determined. Determined to uh, safeguard democracy not only against autocrats, uh, but also bureaucrats who are more fond of uh, complicated uh, rather than simple forms uh, and sometimes oversimplified forms. Uh, so what we need is a permanent oversight. How do we do that? We have wonderfully ranking politicians. I'm very happy to see you here, gentlemen. We have leaders of uh, civic society, charismatic personas. So how do we do that? This is a question to representatives of the NGOs. What do they expect of their politician colleagues in order to put things together and work with politicians? Kubakarish. Well, I, obviously, I'm going to start with polemics. It's not true that nothing happened in the second term of office and that the civic society got um, decided to walk to the back burner. I would like to remind you with the I would like to remind you of the muzzle law and the um, protest march of 2021. Yes, these uh, four years were very tiresome, but let's not forget the Lex TVN. And not for, don't forget that a march was organized in 330 cities and towns across Poland. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, Jacek Zakowski, you, uh, you were there as well, right? You remember that Duda said, well, people came to me and said, don't sign it, and I didn't. So let us not forget how efficient those activities are. We managed to organize people, and people were naturally spontaneous. They went, took to the streets. Nonetheless, then we organized a protest, not to mention uh, the fact that uh, yesterday Ms. Manowska has actually taken the oath of all from uh, uh, all the jury members at the uh, Constitutional Court, 26 of whom actually represent the Committee for the Protection of, Demo of, 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 of Democracy. So I would like to reiterate what Marta Lempart uh, always says. We are going to meet on the job, and here we are on the job. And tomorrow um, there is an anniversary of the um, signing of the uh, campaign to the citizen campaign to observe the elections. I have a T-shirt here for each and every one of you, designed by Karolina Drescher. I believe that the elections are definitely going to take place as they should. We are going to definitely uh, be a watchdog committee. Do join us in our watchdog activity. I would like to everybody to join us, and obviously we want to work with uh, other organizations, and we need um, we have the Temis Justices Organization. We are going to have several dozen thousand people on these committees, and that would be great. This is something that I would expect from politicians and civic organizations. I'm sorry, there are two people talking at the same time. I can't try uh, interpret both gentlemen at the same time. Okay, so let us assume that uh, law and justice will lose and the current oppositionist will take, will, will, will take um, power, will come to, uh, come to power. What do you think the relations, relationship be between the civic society and uh, politicians be in the future? Kuba or Dr. Bodnar? It will be Dr. Bodnar. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much to, for inviting me to take the floor. I'm going to disagree respectfully. I believe that after 2016, uh, political and public protests have been brought to uh, onto a different level. Now we have reached a different stage. Um, the justice system has, or well, the justice has been preserved to a certain extent. 
And it goes without saying that uh, in consequence, we have had, we have been pressured by the European Union and the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. And all that has arisen from a couple of facts. First and foremost, street protests. They legitimized the successive European level activities that have empowered justices and uh, lawyers as well. We could always go back to the 2017 picture. Furthermore, all these activities made all our activities more professional in terms of court trials, and they, they, have, they have enabled us to join forces on a transnational level. We actually worked with our colleagues and professors from different countries. There were international and, well, foreign just, justices who have joined us and who are till, until this day are um, keeping a very close eye on what is going on in Poland. Uh, the same thing goes for Norway. As Professor Vitoshak has already told us, it was very important also from the viewpoint of everything that has happened since. All that allows us to build a post-19 island of pluralism. So wherever Poland looks slightly differently and wherever the discussions are slightly different, well, we may not have protest marches out there in the street, streets, but collaboration went on. At this point, we do at least have a chance, have an opportunity for free elections. In terms of politics, I don't think that parties have reformed or self-reformed. I believe that parties have discovered new mechanisms ruling policy and politics. I believe that uh, campus, campus Poland was truly very important because it has actually shown the true image uh, of uh, political life to young people. Now, taking a look into the future, I believe that one of the most important things that we have to do in terms of our relations with the uh, civic society is a huge promise to be made by the entire democratic society that the legislative process will be treated seriously. Because once we follow the golden standard in the legislative process, that, was gi that will give us open space for normal consultations and uh, citizens' panels and uh, uh, public hearings, all these regular democratic forms of, involvement, of involvement. Now, we should also focus on independent funding and objectivism in assigning mm, public funds, not to mention the fact that uh, political beliefs should not be a factor uh, when assigning grant money. Rules that seem to be a regular thing in all normal countries. Nonetheless, I believe that those are areas where we ought, that we ought to pay specific attention to. I know that Mayor Trashkovsky will not be able to remain with us as long as he would like to. I would now ask Mayor Trashkovsky to comment on the issue because, uh, well, uh, what law and justice did with and to the legislative process is, well, is really the uh, the, the an absolute scandal. Uh, let me mention the most recent Russian uh, law. Nobody knows whether it's a law or, or, or what is it at all. Do you think that after the elections are over and we win, can we truly uh, reinstate a reliable legislative protest, process? It will definitely make the process um, more lengthy. Well, yes, indeed. Good afternoon. We are now on the threshold of the march. I will have to leave you in about one hour and go back to the town hall. But I am very, very happy to... Uh, uh, be here at uh, Collegium uh, Civitas, uh, where we have both been teaching for nearly 20 years. To respond to your question, let me add two other words here. We tend to forget because um, it was slightly, yes, the dynamic of uh, a student protest was slightly different, but let us not forget 
the pandemic or the war. But that is just a description, not an accusation. Yes, but let us not forget these external factors. Um, even the law and even law and justice are uh, claiming that you know they are spent. They don't feel like doing it anymore. Uh, but let us not um, forget that the pandemic gave us a grounds to get mobilized to a different purpose. I would like to emphasize that democracy is alive in Poland thanks to civic society. I have been. Uh, Whenever I asked by foreign journalists, I always uh, tell them that thanks to the society not giving up, thanks to the um, very strong non-governmental organizations, we are where we are. We are not Turkey or Hungary, and we couldn't be either. So it is amazingly important in the context of tomorrow's, or actually the day after tomorrow's march, I would not try to devalue that. Or, or underestimate it. I am a deep believer in not revisiting the past. If the opposition fails to draw conclusions from the fact that today the reality is totally different, we are also living the reality of social media, wherein all our activities are commented on, we will not be able to restore Polish democracy. And that will be hellishly difficult difficult, because, um, we are defin- because we are definitely going to be under pressure, huge pressure. Uh, we are definitely going to win the elections. Uh, I am certain of that. And people are going to say, OK, change it, repair everything now, now, today, tomorrow. Well, we understand it. Um, we want uh, independent media, we don't want to take short shortcuts, and we do want to talk to civil society. But there is no other way out. Well, the opposition was actually tempted to use mechanisms similar to those that law and justice used. Should the opposition um, revisit or d- decide to take shortcuts as well, we are going to lose face and lose the next elections. Nonetheless, uh, maybe, well, the way what, the way forward was, uh, the, 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 way, um, cho- the, the way chosen by law and justice was to create havoc and um, create a horrible situation and then put on black, uh, white gloves and uh, start behaving in a courtly manner. Well, obviously, but that's not the way way out. Let us focus on stage two. We do know that we are going to have a difficult way forward, but what comes next? Well, what is normalcy? Let us take a look at the vast majority of uh, local governments. We provide money to Caritas and to hospice clinics, but also to Krytyka Polityczna. Uh, a left-wing center and press. We are not there to resolve all problems. We let experts do that. And now, um, once we discuss consultations and a citizen's panel, Warsaw was one of the few cities to organize it, we are doing it. And yes, we are very much aware that we could do more, we could do better, but what we need is a golden balance, an equilibrium, and this is exactly what we need to do and focus on as in the opposition. And then maybe we should, you know, switch between politicians and non-politicians uh, when um, inviting people to join citizens' panels. Uh, good afternoon. Just two issues that seem of key importance to me. One of them is what has already been mentioned here, which is the legislative process. It means that the position of the Speaker of Sejm must be weaker than it is today. Because today, uh, law and justice has logically uh, used the construction that is um, included in the bylaws of the Parliament. And it has shown what these bylaws have effectively allowed. So this is the matter of saying goodbye to the fast track institution in the, the way it is operating now because it is extremely convenient to people at power it is deadly for real public debate 
about issues that will determine the public policies for a decade. The third thing that I believe will be rather key is to strengthen the representation of social interests, more strength uh, to the uh, Social Dialogue Council than before. We should not repeat our mistakes uh, from years ago and weaken this council further, because we all know how it ended. So it was an interesting discussion concerning the panels, but we have to remember that there are things that will have to be resolved over decades, and decisions will have to be made, and very difficult burdens will have to be shared. And it will only be possible if Poland starts finally treating the words social dialogue seriously, finally, because so far it has not. Uh, so I believe that the uh, story of forcible reduction of retirement age should teach everybody what are the political consequences of a deficit of social dialogue. And one more thing regarding non-legislative cha challenges. Okay, so would a panel determine the retirement age? No, this is really my argument against Kuba Wignański. We must recognize the role of organized social interests and partners from uh, councils of social dialogue, um, organized employers. A panel will not replace that because the panel is representative uh, in terms of drawing the persons who participate in it, but it's not representative in the sense of mass um, entrenchment uh, or uh, 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 root. So we must make these organizations more representative, not only in the legislative sense. And that means we must facilitate creation of trade unions and encourage the organizations of employers to seriously and not just formally uh, recognize their members. Without that, there will be no possibility of social dialogue or legitimacy. Well, um, dear MP, you were not there when Sarah Morrigan had, uh, Monaghan had held her excellent presentation, who explained that a panel is not a panel, it is a social process. It's a great reflection spectacle that is taking place in face of the entire society. Because a panel as a panel doesn't really make that much sense. I mean, we can have five professors and they will decide. The whole point is the process. I apologize for interrupting you, but I wanted um, Carolina Drescher to have an opportunity to say how she imagines those relationships. Thank you. Well, what the previous speaker said uh, about the role of recognizing organized um, social interests is very important, but we must not forget civic dialogue in the broad sense of the word inclusive of non-government uh, organizations. Because I believe Mr. Chaskowski was very right in observing that we did not mention war, we did not mention COVID. And, you know, previously I might have to prove why organized civic society is important for a well-functioning state that is facing various crises and threats. But after these two situations and this reaction when the organized systems were not capable of reacting quickly and citizens gathered within the NGOs have reacted to those situations. So the role, I mean, those organizations are now battle proven, so to say. I would like to mention two issues that would allow us to uh, position this situation, maybe you asked what are the expectations of NGOs towards politicians. They are huge. But I believe today we will conclude this interesting debate and conference, and each one of us, uh, the, uh, chair, the chairs, the representatives of academia, will all get, go back home, and we will all do similar things. We will take off our suits, put on 
our house slippers and we will think where we want to live. And most of us will want to live in a country that would assure freedom, democracy, where the families would have the sense of freedom and we would look into the future trusting that we as citizens have an influence over it. This is the function of our roles today. Maybe in time these roles will be completely different. But as of now, each one of us is a citizen that fulfills a specific role. The very fact that we are here means that we are not spending this night Friday afternoon drinking coffee. But instead, we talk about things that feel important for the future. We talked a lot about civic society, about NGOs, and a lot of it sounded like Okay, but what is it really? And I think this is the point that uh, the, such a civic organization is really, in truth, organized citizens. Okay, here you have a three-headed goldfish. What will you ask it for? What do you want from it? Uh, I mean, uh, Mayor Trzaskowski, Mr. Kobosko, and Mr. Zandberg, they are the three-headed goldfish. What do you want from the goldfish? Well, what I want personally, I'm not going to say, but I can say what NGOs want. And I'll take the liberty of saying that on behalf of the Polish Federation of NGOs and some organizations that tomorrow in Gdańsk will discuss the very specific ideas for Poland. They won't be talking about what they might want. They will have ready proposals for acts of law, for uh, solutions for the uh, local governments. So I would like to have your attention. Education. Yes, there are 10 major topics. They do not exhaust the entire spectrum. They do not exhaust all the ideas that the NGOs have. but. And I think it's already clear to all of us that there is no going back to the past. Oh, I wouldn't be so sure. Well, I believe that we are not going to go back to a point when myself or my colleagues from NGOs, as they come into the room, have to say, dear all, uh, in regard to the fact that article this and this enables us to take the floor. We have to understand that today, as we face challenges that are truly massive in our country, we have to count resources, and the resources are scanned. So if the resource of active citizens who do not use their excess energy for their own purposes, but to organize themselves, you know, when a citizen wakes up and thinks, I want to change Poland, let, I, I'll call Mr. Zandberg and tell him about it. <laughs> Sometimes he even has a phone number. Uh, so, you know, these ideas do exist. And we have to see each other as soon as possible. Well, what you say is truly compelling, but is there any form of institutionalizing that? Or m maybe just putting it into a procedure? Is there an obvious way to do it? Or is it enough, you know, what, is, what, what we have is enough as long as the politicians do what they are supposed to do? Well, there are many things, uh, for example, the Council of Civic Dialogue or ECESO, Polish Economic and Social Committee, uh, where all the partners have met. It could be expanded to include the Committee of the Regions. Of course, I'm simplifying here, but we have representatives of local governments plus politicians. We could spend many hours on discussions during such interesting conference. But the main question is what next? What happens later? And that's what I'm saying. Tomorrow something important is going to happen in Gdańsk. Most of you might not be able to go there, but everything will be recorded. So you can't explain that uh, you have not heard. Mr. Mayor, do you go to Gdańsk tomorrow? The NGOs have been working on very specific ideas for years. Everything is on the table. You just have to sit down and work on it and work on the kind of Poland that we want to have tomorrow. Well, yes, but in order for that to lead somewhere, we would need the conclusive uh, civic panels, the deliberative ones. So ones that prepare decisions and not just 
Right? You know what I mean. So is it acceptable in light of Polish constitution and Polish political culture? I would like all the gentlemen to, to uh, respond to that. Well, Jacek, I have to start by saying a few words about us, uh, not by way of uh, uh, advertising, but we have the world of NGOs and the world of politics, and I feel like I'm wearing two hats here. We were created as an NGO, and very recently, well, so was a civic platform, well, a little bit longer than that. but. I'm not saying if it's good or bad. I don't assign values, but where are we? Poland 2050 was created at the time of presidential campaign of 2020. Mr. Hołownia ran for president. There were no structures, no branches. People just gathered around him, around us. It was a bottom-up process, and it was the times of COVID, as you remember. So it was... Uh, kind of a campaign without a campaign, because in lockdown you couldn't have an electoral campaign. But there was a lot of civic actions, bottom-up activities. Nobody imposed anything on you know what the people should do. And after the campaign, after the elections, the Association Poland 2050 was created. There were 20-odd thousand volunteers participated, participating who out of their own free will and with no money whatsoever have uh, run these campaigns. And now we have the Association of Poland 2050 and next to it a party was created. So you don't have to explain to us what engaging people is about. People continue doing what they do. Okay, your advertising time is over. Move on to the future. Well, you know, this is not obvious. Everybody says Hołownia's party, Hołownia's party. It is you know, step back a little. It's not the same organization as, well, I'm not going to name other political parties. You did not join the OFOP. No, no, we did not. Wow, clever Karish. Well, we do know what OFOP is. But only representation of Collegium Civitas knows what OFOP is, right? It's a... Uh, Pan-Polish Federation of NGOs. Yes, but I understand that was not the question. The question was what we can change and improve in relationship between the politics and so on. So, so in short, how do we keep living, right? That's very simple. Well, I have to continue with the advertising because also advertising, it's not to get you bored, but just look what we have done. We have prepared a series of programs. We do have those programs, public programs for the next government. What have we done to start with? We organized a consultation of every one of them. You may laugh, but we treat it very seriously and we took it very seriously. Well, if all of you start making this uh, long introductions, we are going to leave. Well, I do think it's a novelty, novelty that a political party takes social consultations seriously. So once we produced the program, our experts wrote it, we had consultations at the same with the NGOs. We listen to their voices, what they think about it, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, and we change things and we put them on our program after consultations. If this is the wrong way to go, tell me it's a wrong way to go. But if you agree with this kind of thinking, we will continue because this is how we see the role of cooperation with the NGO sector. We get ideas, thoughts, energy from them, and it is not going to change after we win. Uh, Paulina Kieszkowska, is it enough? Well, thank you very much for inviting me, first and foremost. We are a small organization that simply chose to work at courts and to collect those puzzles that the politicians could later transform into a picture. So this has shown that, yes, there is a will to cooperate. We had the um, Association for the Rule of Law. We have even worked on agreement for the opposition on how to fix the rule of law. Pa it partially worked, partially didn't. Every organization at some point of this battle has gone back to its positions, whatever they were. 
The point is that there was a discussion, there was a group, there was a work, there was work being done. And the result is that besides this project that was uh, prepared uh, by judges from Justitia with our participation, there is a number of other projects that have been prepared by the social side uh, during this revolution that Adam talked about. Uh, when, you, when he said that uh, the last three years were devoted to positivistic work of getting out of this uh, uh, out of this more uh, swamp that we have gotten ourselves into because hoping for a European Union is all nice but you know you can hardly hardly do it. The uh, women's strike had a programmatic council they had postulates prepared. So what I expect from the opposition after the Sunday march is an attempt to get, in whatever way, collecting together their, the results of the work. And this should be the basis for the revolution, for restoring the framework. Because now we are falling off the cliff. So we all have to wear some sort of a parachute, not to just crash and burn because we are close to a situation when all our activities, civic activities, will be something like atomic reactions under the Chernobyl sarcophagus, because there will be no translation to the political process that will be entirely annihilated. So a lot of work has been done on our side, and it cannot be rejected um, or even psychologically treated as um, an anencastic syndrome, because we feel that we have done a lot of work for those people who take money for their work, and we are treated as nuisance. So if a social group comes in with a proposal, they are not evil people, not lobbyists. They are people who devoted their time. They didn't spend it with their children or riding a bike or drinking coffee but they prepared civic initiatives. So there is a lot of material, and all the democratic forces should make sure that to collect everything from their electorate and, you know, maybe best across the country, but, you know, even from just their own uh, electors. Um, that's the first pre-revolutionary level. The second is what I've been doing before this entire political catastrophe at the Batore Foundation, together with various uh, citizens in a civic legislation forum. A law, an organic law, has to be written. In Poland, it is no longer done. Even the most correct process is done based on a resolution where there are a few words about consultations. It's imprecise. And since the act is complicated, people will be called at some point, some people, we don't know who, doesn't matter. So the mechanisms of a modern world, world of consulting in broad social groups using all kinds of communication, it doesn't have to be a lot of people in the same room. It can be based on various instruments. So it can be done, and we should not wait until elections, because there are a few months before elections still. And, you know, exchange ideas and say, OK, I have this idea, you have that idea, let's meet somewhere, or it's, uh, let's at least make the protocol of differences. We once visited the organization from Israel called MOSP, and they have assumed that uh, they would invite people from various uh, walks of life in Israel, from various parts of Israeli society, assuming that, you know, if we all live here and it doesn't matter that somebody is from Poland or a good Jew or a bad Jew or a b good Pole or bad Pole. And the second item was that we would be different. So we forget the 20% differences we build on the 80% of uh, consent, consensus. And this is how the critical foundation for mutual understanding is built. And only after that, we can go back to the issues uh, that make us differ. 
a lot of work has been done, and that goes without saying. I would like to really focus on what my colleague said. We are an, an extraordinary um, society. We do have our deficiencies, nonetheless. Um, after these eight years, where despicable acts have become the political norm, and uh, um, acts of hatred have also become the norm, targeting women and, and migrants and others. I believe that all we want is to strive for normalcy in the country. The uh, Those in rule have never been even close to uh, to, to uh, constitutional majority. Now, this is, we, this is what makes us different from what happened in Hungary. We also have contact with activists in Israel, and they are still in awe of um, when considering what we have managed to do. So that is all in, t uh, in terms of the, our civic activities. We meet in Brussels, in Luxembourg, and in Strasbourg with all these different people, and everybody is full of admiration at what we have done and our effort. I think that, that we should make that a source of our positive energy and, uh, you know, stop thinking, ah, they didn't take to the streets, it's, you know, they are spent, they're spent. No, that's not true, and it's also very tiresome. Now, since I am the representative of an organization not tied to any political party, I would like to appeal to all citizens to um, speak positively about politicians uh, who are doing really cool stuff. Uh, could we change our tune and say and start saying, okay, you know, deputy from party X did uh, something good. So are we capable of doing that? But then um, my experience tells me that this is when you really catch it from everybody. Well, maybe, well, uh, with all due respect, the jo journalist's job is somewhat different. I simply want us to uh, abandon the narrative of, uh, you know, they can't do things. I would like us to move to the candor narrative. Otherwise, we are going to drown in our national uh, sadness. Is it actually realistic? I'm sorry, I cannot hear the speaker from the floor. Is it actually realistic for representatives of these three political formations to actually create something that would put the substantive aki to the forefront? I know that we are fragmented, that things are different depending on the region, but do you think we could integrate all that and make it something other than a political program? Can we actually turn it into a proposal of Democrats for the future? Mayor. Uh, well, um, please um, don't think I'm reading text messages here. I was taking notes on my phone. Um, I am not trying to be disrespectful here. I suggest that we avoid um, mixing different, confusing different processes. At the end of the day, nobody is going to let politicians off the hook in terms of accountability for their decisions. In the European Union, you have a proposal and then thousands of consultations with the Committee of Regions and so on and so forth. The European Commission takes everything into account and only then the thing goes to the decision makers, following which uh, it goes to the Euro European Parliament. I am a supporter of panels, but I don't think that is the golden remedy. In, um, panels are not there to deal uh, to, with everything. That's what we have politicians for. Nonetheless, I do agree that panels offer a totally different dynamics. For example, if we do not make all decisions concerning green transformation, um, debate breaks out, interest is there, public opinion starts taking interest in a specific thing. Now, I would like to um, definitely 
uh, focus on the postulate that certain things to be, have to be cleaned up, and that is up to the government. And we also have to focus on structural issues uh, faced that Poland is facing. Uh, law and justice are absolutely incapable of doing that. They cannot focus on the uh, residential issues, housing, or uh, anything else, or infrastructure. They are really very good at financial transfers and nothing else. The point is that they are not resolving any of Poland's structural problems, and we need to do that, not least because those are going to be giant issues. Dry, green transformation, for example. If we fail to uh, invite the society in and or NGOs in, in a decision process uh, that is going to be very costly to everybody, we are going to meet with great social resistance. Today we are just about to introduce a clean uh, zone in the city center, which means that all old cars have to be thrown out of the city center. I am deeply convinced that um, that has to be done, and at the end of the day, I'm going to do that. But if I fail to organize consultations, and if I fail to plan, and if I fail to talk to people, uh, well, well, I'm going to fail along the way, uh, um, uh, across the board, because some senior citizens uh, res residing in this zone will not be able uh, to uh, change their old cars, and we are going to have a different approach there. But we are definitely not going to have any, show any leniency to those who are driving fr uh, in from all across the country. Uh, the point is not to pour the baby out with the mouthwater regardless of how needful certain decisions are. So we need clean up. We need to face extraordinary problems that are going to be hugely costly, even if today the, you know, the National Recovery Plan money were to be uh, uh, launched, then we would not be able to make up for the time lost. So if we fail to engage in social dialogue and if we fail to seek um, allies in the NGO sector, we are going to lose across the board and we're going to lose next elections and things are going to go from bad to worse. Do you, uh, are you sensing some kind of political change? Do you remember when uh, Yaroslav Govin became Minister of Justice? He, he knew nothing to, he knew absolutely, a grand total of nothing about the um, uh, uh, justice system, and he was charged with a reform. Uh, do you remember our Minister of Education? Um, um, Minister Zalewska had um, a grand total of uh, zilch knowledge about the education system, and she was charged with organizing reform. Okay, but I think that things will have to come to an end. I don't know that uh, whether everybody understands all these issues as clearly as uh, the local government official, because in the local governments, even if people organize um, consultations every week, they are still going to be accused of not organizing a sufficient number of consultations. But I believe, I simply believe that if we don't take that into account, we're going to lose our next elections. What's using the uh, European Commission? I'm re referencing the European Commission because it's the easiest metaphor here, the easiest comparison. Uh, the European Union actually inv and European Commission, they invite um, local governments in, in order to build social support because you cannot do that without the local level. Now a question to all, all of you. Can we institutionalize the beast? I am not going to definitely uh, um, protect the, or defend Govin. I don't know what you would have to do to defend Govin. But what uh, should we do in order to prevent Govin from coming back? Uh, how to create an institutional mechanism to uh, prevent people, uh, such people coming back? I'm not talking about Govin in person, but incompetent individuals. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. I hope that you forgive me uh, for being late, but I have good news. Today at the University of Łódź, we uh, were celebrating the 30th anniversary of introducing 
the um, of, of Poland ratifying the the Convention of Human Rights, and uh, we our uh, Hanna Mahinska was our guest of honor, and she was talking about what's going on at the border, and it would really be a sin to leave. Moreover, uh, there is a there is there are a number of issues that uh, where the non-governmental organizations have to be involved whether in a formal or less formal way. Some people believe that if we avoid the social and cultural war, we will, then we will be able to avoid a major problem. That is not true. Uh, as proven by the Polish-Belarusian border, as proven by abortion, constitutional court, and so on and so forth. The role of the public and non-governmental organizations is very specific. They should not be the only ones uh, traipsing away into the marshland. Uh, NGOs are definitely going to be there. They will not be annihilated regardless of what the Polish right-wing parties would like uh, to happen. Uh, but uh, it's... Uh, if we only focus on the border and on so-called material and technical activities, we are going to get exactly nowhere. I believe that we should simply focus on um, uh, specific activities. If we, however, start telling stories, uh, you know, that um, we are helping several year old several years old children something that actually ca carries a specific criminal penalty or that um, residents of the Podlasia region are helping those on the border at uh, risking their own um, safety well that is definitely going to be a different story we do know that accounts given by politicians are always going to be slightly different but i think that uh, if we if we try to avoid the uh, right wing narrative and if we start beginning telling if we begin telling stories then it is going to be successful i know that, that the, what the narrative of right wing parties is but i think that we uh, it will come as no surprise to anybody that we are not avoiding topics and we have been taking part of a variety of campaigns. The point is that we are presenting our opinions concerning each and every one of those subjects. Well, um, people have been complaining that young people are very passive in terms of the elections and uh, or the um, the um you know if uh, if uh, people start complaining that um, you know young people are not going to the polls or that you know planes keep uh, crashing and dropping those are not topics interesting to the to to to, to our young voters uh, they need stories that they can relate to carolina thank you very much let me move to a very practical I issue the as a pan polish or nationwide um, organization, we asked NGOs and we asked politicians whether they have specific proposals for NGOs. Okay, we asked all opposition political parties what their proposals for NGOs would be. And we already received a couple of answers and this is exactly what we are waiting for. And this is something that I would like to draw your attention to. Actually, the uh, law and the justice uh, have actually done their homework because their program did contain specific proposals for the civic society um, and they had actually implemented quite a few of their proposals. Obviously, it was, um, you know, it was a horrible way they did it, if only given the money sharing mechanism. Nonetheless, they did have a program and they did do something. And this is also a comment to, for those of you, ladies and gentlemen, who are responsible for political party programs. As the national or nationwide or pan-Polish federation, we are focusing on supportive measures. We have obviously been focusing on a variety of 
subjects, uh, climate, education, through to young people. And we are working with organizations with so-called mass membership. Nonetheless, we are always asking what of these, which of these program components will actually be implemented in order to make the life of civic society easier. We, we have already been asking questions such as uh, how should we mobilize our society, for example. Such postulates should all uh, should be made part of uh, everything that Kuba Kotsian was talking about. This is exactly the kind of system uh, wherein uh, we meet to discuss different things when meeting at such events as today's. I believe that this is all about an equilibrium as to who um, currently holds the um, conch, so to, to speak, because several years ago, um, the civil society were, uh, claimed that they are going to be organizing marches without um, politicians joining us. Whereas today, we uh, what we have is a march organized by the civic platform, and they are not exactly inviting NGOs to join them on stage. I'm not saying that they are shirking them, but this is by no means a joint task. So I think that this is something that we will have to do. What we need is a well-oiled machine where all relationships would actually work. Do you think that we have an option like that at all, Cuba? Well, there is a game that uh, is called Hide Your Ego, and actually sometimes it even works. I will, In reference to what Kuba said, I think this is hugely important because this is not how you win elections. That's not a case, that's not a subject. The society is not interested in what's going on against the Polish-Belarusian border. And whenever you get that topic on board as part of your campaign, it's going to be to the detriment of anybody mentioning it. I would like to live in a country where we could actually bring such topics to the forefront, regardless of what's going on, because helping children at the board, uh, on the border is hugely, hugely important. Nonetheless, I'm really very happy to see this uh, analysis that we have, you know, had this kind of romantic uh, bursting forth, um, proceeding to the positivistic grassroots development. But uh, in reference to Polish history, I would not want us to end up with a coup d'etat of May 1926. And let us. Um, not think that we have already won. We haven't, because the bear is really happy running around uh, the forest and, uh, you know, is setting up Lex Tusk and uh, generated uh, and, and produced four uh, and, uh, and, and producing horrible videos. I myself have uh, have uh, produced four films about the Holocaust, and I'm sorry to say it, but I'm happy that my heroes, uh, my produ product protagonists are already dead, because that, that means that they could not uh, that they uh, they could not watch the absolutely despicable film made by Law and Justice. Uh, obviously, we would need to change the format. I would really love a, a life, a world where every, all politicians would be posting their numbers online. People could call them up with their ideas. Uh, Rafał Trzaskowski said something uh, absolutely correct. There is no revisiting the pre-2015 world. You should. We. You cannot do everything by making institutional changes or you know moving your building blocks around. The only thing you can do is um, begin res is is by respecting each other. What you need is a structure built on mutual respect, because we have to respect politicians for what they do. We can't simply, you know, put the law, act of law down on the table and tell politicians, now you are, now you shall um, be implementing that act of law. Absolutely not. We have to work together and we should work to together. And that is the very essence of the matter. If we respect each other and if we play the hide your ego game, 
if we play the hide your ego game successfully, then at the end of the day, it will turn out that we are on the same page and that we don't want old diesel cars in the city center either. Uh, but um, we also now we also know that we cannot simply impose a draconian law on everybody, including senior citizens. Just like Rafał said, we should learn to listen to one another. What do we owe to Jarosław Kaczyński? We owe to Jarosław Kaczyński um, that we have actually done more for the civic society for over the last eight years than over the previous 30. Why? Because we were terrified enough to start think, uh, talking to one another. We would not have met here in 2014. Why the hell would we? Okay, I'm now going to hand the mic over. Uh, yeah, that would be great because I understand that there are some of us have, uh, uh, you know, have other duties to attend to. I did not want to, you know, kind of uh, uh, um, uh, run behind the mayor here. But yeah, well, I, I can stay here until 4.30, but, but then I, you know, I have some stuff to attend to. I will only take a few minutes. Um, I would like to add three topics to the discussion as they have not been mentioned yet. I believe that when we talk about the civic society, um, I think I'm going here to what Kuba Wignański once said. We think about this idealistic, pro-democratic, pro-European, committed civic society. And I believe that the recent years have shown us that what we have is a polarization of the civic society and there are various organizations that enjoy the freedom of uh, association and freedom of speech and so on but they may have very different views moreover these views about the future of Poland may fall may fit within their democratic discourse under one project today, I've uh, corresponded with Professor Markowski present here, and I have discovered such organizations as the Warriors of Mary and Soldiers of Christ. I don't know if it's a far right, if it's a church organization, social. So if we look at it, I mean, we should create equal, absolutely equal, transparent rule for everybody. Rules concerning financing, public relationships, involvement in legislative process, civic panel, for everybody, regardless of whether the given organization comes from, as long as it does not intend to destroy democratic structures going in radical directions. The second issue is that if we look at civic society, let's think how much time has been wasted over the recent years in terms of shaping civic attitudes of young people. Now uh, the knowledge of society has been removed from the curriculum. It was still very petrified. There was no education for climate, education for peace, civic education at school. All those things need to be rebuilt. And I think this is the great responsibility of democratic opposition, that in case of when they choose the new Minister of Education, it should be the person who not only administers education, but would have a vision of democratic education, of a democratic citizen. That is what education should serve. And I would like to appreciate one initiative that has been uh, launched right, right after the uh, pandemic. It was the Constitution Movement, and it has shown, it is important because it has shown that uh, citizens are also present in super small towns, and you have to go there, you have to meet them, and you have to engage them in uh, civic life. So this regional aspect of uh, civic society, the topics of discussion are completely different there. The matter of access to sources of information, the media desert that uh, occurs in some places. I think these are among the most important aspects of strengthening the civic society and also responsibility of politicians, you know, how, how to do it. Yes, we will talk more about that in July during the meeting of Concilium Civitas when Professor Kishlovsky will be with us.
uh, we will talk about the vision of activating civic society in the political um, aspect via the local government or self-government chambers by increasing the competences of self-governments. That, of course, activizes the third sector. It all comes together. This will be definitely the topic for a very serious debate. But I wanted to ask you whether any of you see the need for a systemic change. I mean, I know that changing the constitution is not something that you know you can do quickly by the end of the year. But, for example, creating a mechanism under which one house of the parliament is not party bound and politicized, but is a social and self-government chamber because we see that excessive uh, party presence that does not always lead to good results. So do you see such a possibility? Let's start with Mr. Mayer and Dr. Bodnar and uh, Dr. Ach, Dr. Bodnar is already leaving. Sorry, thank you very much. Mr. Mayer, will you respond before you go? Let's do this because Adrian only spoke once, so maybe you should go first and then I will wrap up. Well, I would like to go back to the previous question because it seems important to me. I have a very practical proposal here uh, with regard to not losing the knowledge that is being created by NGOs. You know, there is uh, there are understandings pertaining to long-term issues and they are signed by parties that disagree with each other on various matters. There will always be things that we disagree on. Always. The first example, I mean, uh, housing policy. It is obvious that there is a difference between the platform and the left platform wants more loans, uh, the left wants more social housing. If we discussed it with the colleagues from the third path, probably their solutions regarding the health are more liberal, ours are more redistributive. But there are things with regard to which we probably could combine knowledge that has been built, uh, created thanks to uh, the move, social movements and some things simply make deals on. Let me give you three examples. The first one is a strange thing and I'm very surprised we didn't do that and I'm very surprised to see little enthusiasm to do it. As far as the rule of law is concerned, here really all the opposition uh, formations are in agreement with regard to the order of values. So rationalization in my opinion should be uh, such that all the opposition parties, not after the elections, not three months after the elections, but before uh, the elections, all the parties should sign an agreement on their commitment to implement certain changes. And here in arguing against um, Mr. Zhakovsky, if we take the logic of uh, making order by non-constitutional methods, it won't end well. The history of Red Revolution in Russia shows that after the first stage of lawlessness, there comes second. So I would warn against this. Oh, no, I did not give permission for such uh, actions. I just said that one way or the other, the road is going to be bumpy. You see, this understanding is understood as uh, understanding for the rule of law, and we signed it. But the point is to operationalize it, because right now we are at the level of declaration of values. And what we should be doing today, we should be today already at the level of implementing acts. The translators can't hear the speaker. The response is, I would like to see the signatures. I mean, realistically, there will be three uh, opposition lists, I would like to see the signatures of leaders of all of them under the Declaration of Implementing Specific Solutions. That would be fair before the elections. And the second thing, the second area where we could enter into such an agreement is the area of education. I believe that it will not cover all the possible solutions because there are differences here as well. But, and here some good work has been done, the Foundation for Education, there are some proposals we could also sign. 
The third thing I'm hoping for is the third area. Professor Bodnar talked about it very well when he talked about school, saying that this is a space where you either create Democrats or you don't. There is another space outside school where there is not enough democracy and we pay for that, specifically the workplace. It's the place where people spend most of the time and it is very authoritarian in Poland. In the workspace there is very little freedom of speech, very little culture of democratic negotiation. So. In this area, I think it will be difficult to achieve such an understanding before the elections, but I would like us to take this challenge very seriously, democratizing the workspace. Without increasing the strength of the voice of employees in Poland, Polish democracy will be very, very weak for a long time. Yes, and the life will be uh, poor and the losses will be great. I mean, you can see it in the recent scandals in the media when we suffer enormous losses because there is no system of preventing losses, no loss control. Uh, yes, now let's give the floor to Mr. Mayor because he has to leave us. Well, I generally I agree with that. I believe that one way to escape this very troublesome discussion about the number of lists and who is going to be the leader and who will be uh, trying to be, a pre to be a president in 2048, the, none of us is going to rule one handed, single handed. So we have to talk about what things we agree on and what we actually really want to do. I would add one more thing, I mean, due to uh, the fact that I am who I am, but because it already happened, namely support for self-government, for local governments. We have signed such a memorandum and it is important that later in face of huge budget problems to deliver on it. Because I think we all agree, I'm not talking about Warsaw here, I'm talking generally about the local government when the local governments often do their jobs better than the central government because uh, the local government uh, of, uh, people walk the streets of their towns and they are f held accountable faster. Say housing. In Warsaw we have both methods. On the one hand we invest in social and municipal housing and we invest quite a bit. I know we could invest more, you don't have to explain it to me. And please compare because I understand that, you know, criticism is always due but Please compare in percentages what government did and what self-government did. And then we have the TBS system, which is problematic because people's rents have gone so high up due to uh, changed interest rates that we don't know what to do about it. And now we are, this is a problem we're trying to solve. So let's discuss what we have in common, because this will force us to refer to things that have already been worked out. We can't say that we don't care about it. So the things that were worked out before must be the part of everything that we do going on. Of course we will not agree on every th everything and it would be strange if we could, but I think there is a possibility of developing the minimum of what we agree on in the most important issues, like the gr New Green Deal, the minimum first steps, because if we start arguing about priorities once we form the government, our colleagues form the government, we would lose months and months. So first, we should agree on a few things that we all agree about in case I, 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 with respect to the Green Deal, so that they can be implemented right away when the opposition takes power. And there was a question about the Senate. I do believe that uh, socializing uh, the public media and social organizations, yes, but let's not try the solutions Let's not believe that a Senate formed of citizens and local governments would completely heal the situation. I don't think this is an ideal uh, situation. If we were to uh, make the process of consultations more civic, leaving the decision to those who made it is right. I mean, it's not, I mean, I know nobody likes the politicians, nobody likes us. I mean, I'll take it on the chin, but the politicians do have a role to play. So once again, if we say there is no going back to certain practices of 2015, I'm not sure that everybody fully understands it. 
But I believe this is not a matter of playing cute, you know, that, you know, like as a self-government person, I have some experience. The matter is, if we don't do it, I'm absolutely convinced that the populists will come back to power and much stronger. This is the greatest threat. I'm trying to explain it to everybody. I don't know if they understand. And it will be extremely difficult because once I imagine that if I were to be a minister and I try to imagine what I would be confronted with, I mean, I'm not intending to be a minister, just to make things clear. But if I imagine what I would be confronted with after the eight years of what they've done, I know what it would look like. You know, there would be losing sleep, working 24-7, uh, and here's a meeting, here's a hearing. It's not always easy to make use of all of that. People always catch me and say, Mr. Mayor, 40 minutes. What do you mean 40 minutes, I say? My meetings are 10, 15 minutes with everybody. And you know, and people are insulted. And they say, I need 45 minutes to an hour to explain everything to you. So the most important and most difficult resource is time. Hence, the question for institutionalization and mechanisms is so important. You can't talk with everybody, but now is the time. Now is the time. If we agree on a minimum, you can't depart from what has been already developed and you can move things forward. I'm sorry, I have to go back to the town hall. All the best to all of you. Well, before you leave, please find 15 minutes for those people from TBS North, because it's really time. I went to an open meeting in Śródmieście yesterday and we, uh, I told them that this meeting will be held in June uh, and now we are waiting for a responsible solution to be uh, properly developed. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Now we are fewer, so we will have more time. We forgot about the media. Oh, you mean to invite a journalist? No, no, no. In this listing uh, of Adrian, media were absent. And yes, but uh, Mr. Mayor reminded us about that. Certainly. Well, um, I can justify why I skipped media. Because I remember quite well what happened uh, at the previous attempt to make media more civic, more social. So I want to. Uh, delineate objectives realistically enough to be able to believe them. I don't frankly believe that we would be able to agree with Platforma before elections about that. Well, we've signed a few agreements with Platforma about that. I'm also a co-author of an act that Donald Tusk approved personally and then the chairman of the Platforma uh, Club said, well, if the Prime Minister approved it, let him enact it. So I'm saying that because it's not like, you know, when Mr. Mayor Trzaskowski says that he likes something, it still doesn't mean that despite his powerful position in his party, he would be able to make it happen. Yes, I can hear, see Mr. Kobosko nodding his head. It's not enough to get the approval of your bosses. You also must find understanding among the broad party elite. But I would like to go back to the matter of guarantees. Are we capable of institutionalizing better? Can we offer to the parties a better institutionalization, more effective institutionalization of social dialogue than what we have on paper now? Paulina Kieszkowska. Well, uh, various ideas per pertaining to that were the topic of work of the uh, Civic Legislation Forum of Batory Foundation and the Kubas Foundation. There are many ideas. I'm not going to talk about the Senate's ideas because I'm not really knowledgeable in that regard, but regardless of what we write down, it's like what Professor Wyszykowski once said, no matter how many locks you have, if a thief comes, he can break them all. So we thought we would live in a normal country and we thought there would be an act that would bind all parties with regard to lawmaking. But everything, every law was broken, including the Constitution, so it does not protect us fully. So what we need to build now is the social disapproval or social 
uh, discontent. Now lawyers go to schools. I had a, a meeting with eight classes in Garvolin myself. But the politicians can't fix anything if we still have a situation when we have a thousand uh, lawyers this week and there is a hundred thousand uh, lawyers in Poland and there are more schools asking than lawyers ready to provide. So our lament that uh, teachers are passive, they are afraid, but no, there are people, people asked for lawyers, but there were not enough lawyers. So some people, like myself, had to spend two days doing that instead of one. So what did other lawyers working at the center and billing uh, done about that? I'm a lawyer myself. I have to keep my family alive. So the elite does not deliver, and m more people with skills and education have to get involved. And we have to stop lamenting that the sovereign did this or the sovereign did that, because people don't have to know the mechanisms. And besides, they are perpetually lied to. So some of them make decisions that seem rational to them, based on what the media tell them. So I always think about that in the category of beating your own chest uh, and think of what you have failed to do. And the uh, hide your ego game, of course, goes for all of us. But the major problem is really to start with the man in the mirror. I, I remember when Donald Tusk called a pro-EU demonstration, I can't remember which absurd catastrophic law caused it, and there was a lament. Donald Tusk failed to attract the youth. Okay, so where was, uh, where were your sons, I asked, uh, well, and, and what I heard from a, my politician colleague was, well, one of them was preparing for exams, the other one was somewhere. So I said, okay, well, why do you expect Donald Tusk to do anything? Yes, you can do more, it goes without saying, you can do more, you can collaborate. Uh, more broadly, you can hide your ego, yes, indeed, but we have to deliver ourselves. We have done a lot as a civic society, but uh, we actually, uh, you know, have uh, nothing but uh, problems with the legal world, that they are not doing enough. Uh, well, they are doing whatever they can, and they are really dead dog tired as are we we have done a lot as part of our career to do whatever we can uh, we have been social act activists as well as supporting our fam uh, families obviously if there were 10 times more of us the story would be quite different well we know that a business is business everybody knows the old adage nonetheless uh, this is something that we have to bear in mind. I know that Kuba Bogdanski was presented with the award of the Polish Business Roundtable, but I think that's kind of, uh, you know, uh, it was high time, right? Uh, he has been doing stuff for ages. So you, we have to do what we have to do. Your homework would be to um, come up with a uh, an idea where people could actually um, post their achievements. I know that some of our formats have already been de-egotized, so to speak, and as has been the Justitia format. So the point is to focus on restore the, uh, you know, four wheels to the car. This is, has been done already. We have many such uh, ideas after the tragic death of the boy One of the political parties had put together a serious case review law. Uh, well, obviously, uh, some of us have put together some proposals that are doing a grand total of nothing in the presidential chancellery. Uh, chancellery, excuse me. We have to do whatever we can in order to prevent the tragic death of children at the hands of their own parents. So the point is that, uh, yeah, we we do agree. As to the principle, we we may disagree as to the uh, broad strokes. 
we do understand that certain assumptions have been different to what they are now, now that we are done with, uh, with, with the fundamental decisions. But the fundamental thing to remember is that nobody will do the job for us. Uh, you know, the right wing or left wing or the, you know, a committee for the protection of democracy. No, nobody will do stuff for us. We all have to do uh, our job. And otherwise, the sum of all our activities would not be sufficient. So, yes, look at yourself before you uh, start criticizing others. Don't put your slippers uh, when you get home. Put on, uh, you know, your spurs or stilettos. Uh, well, as the forum of donors, we have done whatever we could in order to put to to do to, to do the job. Now, over, over the past two years, um, we have been talking over the past two years to academics and to NGOs in order to find out which directions which direction we ought to develop into or to uh, or in in order for the. Uh, in order to support Poland in her development and uh, meeting her challenges. Well, you asked the goldfish question, didn't you? Well, our material is rather complex, but I have come up with three wishes, one of which I'm going to address Two persons responsible for party programs. What we need is a trust-based civic society. Businesses have that already, don't don't they? Well, we have obvi obviously been hearing about different discussions about how we should take care of businesses. And we as organizations are really envious of them because not only the political party, but uh, anybody else, you know, um, we are considered to be a subgroup. We, the money that we are spending on others is considered uh, suspicious. So this is exactly why we would really love an equivalent of the business constitution. We would uh, like a world where any doubts would be resolved to benefit NGOs. But that affects everybody else. As organizations, we have become used to the fact that we have to, you know, keep explaining ourselves. That's wish number one. Wish number two would be to do away uh, with... Uh, wish number three, I'm simply going to be reiterating something you have to said, you have said before, uh, including Mr. Adam Bodnar and Ms. Kieszkowska. What we would really like is a social dialogue where every party could be uh, listened to. Well, um, thank you very much for what you have said here. It was really hugely interesting. I remember a uh, I remember a text that I wrote um, in 2019 it was called 1000 days for the republic and I remember and I believe that today it is very very important to bring about an agreement among the three parties. It would really be great. I'm sorry, the speaker is being hugely chaotic. Things have changed over the fa past four years. It's not only that we demand and not only that we expect. Uh, indeed, our competencies have also improved with regard to migration. For example, in 2014, we were totally 
in a totally different place uh, where we are now. We have become much more competent across the board, including end-of-life decisions, for example. We also have to come up with a machine uh, focusing on a number of issues. The seven uh, rules of consultation is a very simple document. It is now 10 years old, and it has formally been introduced. Very simple issues, you know, respect for public interest. We can depark things in order not to bore you to death. Apart from the uh, Gdańsk episode, tomorrow where we are going to have uploaded a number of packages. How would you swiftly bring about solutions before the elections? I am old enough to have been witness at the round table. But the point is that we need to identify bits and pieces where we introduce uh, solutions cluster by cluster. Somebody has to moderate and will guarantee that people walking in have some kind of, you know, a specific set of competencies. I believe that this is something we need in the future, and I was really happy to see that people have begun to start talking to uh, one another, regardless of political differences. Uh, I think that this is a postulate to Kuba Karish. I think that he would be a great facilitator of the process. Should any political party take over, all the rest would have a problem with it which is quite natural. We are going to obviously go back to the screening or sortition issue. We are going to um, focus on what we discussed in the, during the morning session. Uh, yes, I remember, you know, I, I, I can see that quite a, few, quite a few of you are looking at me expectantly to go back uh, and waiting for me to go back to sortition as a method of identifying reliable representation of the society. Good afternoon. My name is Zofia Saneiko. I would like to reference what you said in, at the outset of this meeting. You concluded that, you know, NGOs have it much worse. Yes, indeed, they have it much worse. Why? Because they are very often the same people who are simply more and more tired because recruiting new citizens to become active, and it is very important for NGO movements to be massive, because only then will politicians and the society take heed. Nonetheless, everybody has to know what uh, these organizations are doing, and that is my request to the media. First and foremost, the media sometimes don't make the necessary effort to find out what NGOs are doing in Gdańsk or, or, or the south of Poland or uh, in the Podlasia region. The only thing that they care about are um, civic society protests or street marches. And even uh, then, organizations run to the media requesting coverage, and they tell NGOs, mm, yeah, we will do it, but later, and later it turns out that, you know, um, 200 people took the streets. I believe that what the NGOs are doing and how it's covered by the media, it's, you know, heaven and earth in terms of how the government is shown, for example. I'm not going to discuss the economics of media. I can do that after class. Thank you very much, Anja Duniewicz, coordinator of the Our Advocate Initiative, part of the Nationwide Federation of NGOs. I would like to 
up the topic of social consultations. I'm really very grateful for the postulate not to lose the tremendous social energy or hope for cooperation. Let me mention an example. We happen to have 10 task forces working in diverse areas. Women's rights to rights of persons with disabilities, caregivers, refugees, and so on and so forth. We have been working our butts off to come up with a position of our association uh, concerning the uh, uh, care giving benefit. Do you remember what happened in the parliament? The chair blocking the way was definitely became something of a symbol for the government and the parliament moving away from what to uh, or turning their backs on what ought to be the core of public debate. So let us not lose our energy. Let us take advantage of the accomplishment of people who are already working very hard to develop very much um, uh, needed initiatives. Let us not put a chair between us and the rest of the world. Good afternoon. I have the following question. You as politicians, you as uh, persons caring for Poland's future, are you not terrified with how with the very low number of uh, students represented here at the debate. This debate focusing on uh, Poland's future, including courts of law and the judiciary in general, and other matters that are important to all of us. Don't, aren't you terrified with how few representatives of the younger generation have shown up how few people are willing to confront their opinions with yours. And with regard to opposition slogans, you are telling us that you are united and strong and that our opposition is stronger here than in um, um, Hungary or Turkey. Maybe that is true, but aren't you therefore Cannot you be accused of the sin of uh, pride? Also, in terms of not focusing on issues important to those uh, the young people who are going to vote in the autumn, such as, for example, economic matters and others of key importance to Poland, not to mention legislative issues. They may seem more easy to debate. They seem easier to um, ponder. Nonetheless, I would be really interested in how in your position concerning um, the military, for example, and economics, also in the context of the absence and or presence of young people. Kuba Kotsian is going to uh, respond in all probability. I am going to uh, start with changes concerning systemic, with the question concerning systemic changes. I think that we have a tendency to believe that there's going to be a single magic remedy making politics, dirty politics disappear. Some people believe that referendums are the correct way to go. Others believe that panels ought to be organized. Still others believe that a huge change to the Senate would actually make a difference. Nonetheless, I think that those problems are much more profound and there is no such thing as a single remedy. We also have a discussion, ongoing discussion as to the future form of the uh, Constitutional Court. Uh, it has been suggested that 60% of members ought to be elected by the parliament. But let us take a look at the US, uh, the filibuster, the 60% um, of threshold, um, which has actually brought America to a standstill. Um, 
and it has done quite a lot of harm to the Supreme Court, and it has affected the Supreme Court to a greater co- uh, extent than the Congress. So I think that we have to bear in mind that there is no golden measure to remedy and rectify democracy in a single stroke. Let us bear constitution, the constitutional case in mind. We thought that okay. Um, we believe that there would be 15, that that 15 members ought to be appointed to the uh, National um, Council of the Judiciary, and I believe, and then they could not find a way out or a loophole. Yes, they would. They would use a different measure. Um, let us mention the case of uh, Poland adhering to international courts ruling. I think that we ought to also uh, go back to the number of young people uh, present here. I don't think that, you know, young people are, uh, this is not, you know, the, the young people's perfect idea for a Friday evening. I think that what we can do, we can try to self-organize on lower levels at specific universities and for purpose of specific activities. We will never come up with a golden solution bringing people in on a Friday evening. Well, there are uh, solutions. You can, uh, for example, have an act on uh, mandatory military service at 20 and then the students will come in droves. Well, yes, but this is how we had our public debate for years. And it is important that, like Mr. Zandberg um, mentioned many areas that could mobilize specific social groups, but we will not mobilize any generation by just complaining that they are not there. Okay, we are running out of time, so just very briefly, Paweł Kasprzak. The floor is yours. Yes, I know, Paweł, it is a challenge. But let's do it like this. I hold the microphone and you speak. Well, I would like to refer to something that Kuba Kocian already mentioned, because I uh, had to see no responses to your questions about institutional guarantees of a dialogue rather than goodwill. I don't believe in goodwill, not because I don't like the politicians, although I'm not overly fond, fond of them, but because it is my role to be skeptical. And of course, the systemic changes. This morning, we have heard a story that I found fascinating about what happened in Ireland. And what happened was a change in abortion laws that has fundamental constitutional importance. And it was a systemic change because the power was given to the people and the power belongs to the people and not to the politicians. And this topic is never ever discussed. We talk about education. You know, when I was young, I thought that with age I would become more patient, but it was quite the opposite. I mean, I'm about to die. If I were to wait for education debate to provide uh, distributed constitutional control in Poland, I would die waiting. Instead of that, I have broken a number of peace laws and I was tried in court. So when we talk about the system, I believe it all has importance. It is not true that there are no systemic solutions uh, or laws that the peace mobsters could not destroy. Because if we go back to the fundamental division of powers, if we really did have division of powers in Poland, if it could not be destroyed in a single storm, a peace um, uh, attack could not have happened. We have a system that is uh, rotten and eaten by a pathology that very few people talked about. Poland 2050 has prepared consultations, and I have seen them on a change of the uh, financing of political parties and finding candidates, and it's becoming pretty feudal. I mean, there are no guarantees here, but there is a rapid decrease uh, in probability. If peace were a democratic party rather than a 
And if they had to explain uh, their procedures in front of cameras, and uh, so the problem is to do things before somebody comes in with a baseball bat and simply shatters every law we can think of. So, you know, I'm against the politicians um, and expecting things from them. My role is to disbelieve. I have very specific expectations and you are aware of them. So, I would expect guarantees. I would expect talking about the system because a party-based parliament will not reform the political situation. You can't be your own surgeon. So this is not the right kind of hammer, yes. Well, just very briefly, because too many times you have mentioned me for me not to respond. Let me just say that once when I've offered to Mr. Zhakovsky that the first thing we should do was changing the act on political parties, and he very reasonably uh, poured some cool water on me, and he said, you know, given that peace is at power, I wouldn't do it, I would wait. Yes, that act requires change, and not only for that reason, but mostly because, you know, when a young 65-year-old retiree would like to go to politics, he is smart, say he has a doctorate and whatever, he can't because his uh, pension is very low. And that's the main reason he can't go to politics. Politics is uh, fun for the elite in our country, and that's, that should not be. And just a brief anecdote, it was 2017 when Mr. Andrzej Rzepliński for the first time came to Podkarpacie. First he went to Lubaczów, it's a small town, and uh, then he went to Rzeszów, there were maybe 150 people. And at a certain point, Professor Rzepliński asked, it was 2017, November, do we have a judge in the room? He asked, and crickets. And the what about a prosecutor? One. How about attorney? Two of them. And what changed since 2017 is a time we're in 2023 now. Uh, let's hope we have more lawyers in the room. I hope that think if we have such meetings in three years, if we have good reason, and we certainly will, there will be more young people because they will know that it is worthwhile. That's how people learn. And besides, if we said on TV that such a meeting is going to happen, but we can't say it because media were not mentioned and public media are not public, more people would come as well. So I suggest we talk about media, at least a few words. We could have five round tables out of the meeting today, so let's try to do that. Okay, you do that and let Zandberg talk. I wanted to mention the guarantees. I have a feeling that I already talked about one thing, namely as far as legislative process is concerned, you can do a lot by taking the speaker and a majority from the authoritarian party in, a go in the government. Our party system is built as a result of an allergy after 1989. Uh, Democratic Poland was so frightened of losing power that they consolidated power. And many uh, commentators said that, yes, it is good if you consolidate, consolidate power because you don't hold power closely, you can't uh, rule it. And it's not true because we have many countries that do not have such concentrated power, and thanks to this, they have a greater inflow of ideas. So 
the fact that peace was able to win was the result of activity of, of all the political um, forces that have organized the power the way it is organized. And we should talk about how we could distribute it more. If we have such a high barrier to entering politics, we can imagine and decree the most beautiful ways to finance the political parties. But if uh, the politics is polarized, it would be empty words because there would be no competition. And we pay the price for it. So if I were to move the system, we would pay the price. So as for uh, the uh, sortition, the performance Redakteur Zhakovsky talked about may legitimize the process, but it will not provide us with partner. We must build collective partners that have that are empowered. Otherwise. Uh, it's not going to work. With the level of unions that we have in Poland, we will not have democracy. We have, ease, we must have the easier building of trade unions and other social groups of interest. We have to stop looking at it like it's something ugly. No, it's the nature of democracy that there are various interests. Let's accept the differences, the variety. And let's accept that nobody in Poland will ever have enough power to rule alone, because this fantasy on a single government by a single strong hand has hopefully become compromised enough uh, for everybody to say goodbye to this temptation, especially if they consider themselves Democrats. Thank you very much. I found it very interesting. The problem of managerism and presidentialism in the st structures of the state is always a huge challenge and usually leads to a catastrophe because it's not just the bylaws of the uh, uh, same and so on, but we have the structure the, of enterprise that's managerial, presidentialistic. It's pretty much entire Polish world, just a small monarchy, tiny monarchies. A uh, third time, Tomek Kozłowski. Hello, everybody. I feel called here as a citizen by Paulina in the understanding of what Adrian said about the Scandinavian agreement and what Kuba said. Just an idea, a little bit lawyerized. Uh, we said that the politician makes decisions, but, dear young ones, Global corporations plan for 25 years today. We have to plan for 25. All the problems that we discussed here, education, healthcare, climate, and so on. As an important example, I would say that, you know, President Lukashevich, he already left, but we care about uh, European awareness. And if Europe is to be a continent of peace, we have to take care of the law and the right to public space, the space that surrounds us, the, the virtual and the real one. So I think then you would come to us, you would come to the citizens once you see. Somebody could say, OK, peace will come and destroy it. Wait a minute. If it is prepared in a Norwegian spirit, who knows? It might be utopian, but it may end up being quite realistic. Thank you. And the last one, Professor Markovsky. Thank you very much. I understand we can uh, talk about this uh, ballot. I mean, we're fascinated by the fact that there was a ballot in Greece. But we should, first and foremost, look at Florence's experience of the Middle Ages. We have to remember one thing. What they did, they drew lots from among people of a certain status, and they were a few, and it made sense to, uh, uh, to draw lots. And everything that is done under the civilocracy, so first it is sortition, but later, we have the reasoning tests. 
and personality tests. You know, those people are facing various tests to see if they are competent in terms of simple math, writing simple applications, and the ability to articulate what they want to say. Well, there is too many people here, but I would say, just between us, that recently we have conducted a survey of political uh, capacity of polls. We can't publish the results because it would be insulting to the citizens. So maybe when the, when the opposition wins, we would find the courage because otherwise we would be just on trial for insulting the nation. I can tell you what the Polish citizens know about their own country. There were 30-something questions uh, concerning how the country functions, including the simplest question of how many houses the Polish parliament has. And half the Polish people don't know that it's two. One person said 48. So, yes, I know advocates Diaboli and so on and so forth, but please, Uh, I'm talking to people it doesn't pertain to, but you know, we can go 50 kilometers towards Bug and we will see a completely different world. Of course, we may assume that there are, you know, they have different reasoning, they have different sources of political knowledge, and we should look into it as researchers. But taking the shortcut and just drawing lots from whatever we have is a road to nowhere. So as I said, with regard to all those various deliberative uh, actions, you know, there is always an assumption that if you select somebody for this group, they have a rudimentary ability to express themselves. You know, if they are an introvert and they, they can't talk, you, re you survey them, but you don't uh, talk to them. But it's not a problem. Well, possibly, the translators can't hear the speaker. Please turn the microphone on. The interpreters can't hear the speaker. Well, of course, in our case, the 1% party does not have the hub sem. No, absolutely not. And before that, there was 7%. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very brief moment of this panel left, so I suggest that each one of you uses his minute well. Okay, uh, well, Mr. Zhakovsky didn't give me many chances in this debate, but of course we have neither law nor justice here. So, first of all, thank you very much for this appeal from the very beginning of the debate to not shoot the politicians. Thank you. Yes, politicians are generally disliked, but we have a certain vicious circle here. We dislike the politicians, so they look hopeless to us. So. Nobody new wants to go to politics. And this is the problem with young people who don't want to go to the politi politics. We believe that it is necessary to renew Polish politics, to bring young people in. We want to bring as many young people as possible. Although, as has been stated recently, Polish party system is built in such a way to, as to not admit new political parties. None not left, not right, none. Rafał at one point talked about the European Union and the consultations process preparing a new law. You know, everything looked fantastic. Let's just imagine those elections. We do not have vanity or certainty but let's imagine those elections. Let's imagine that the opposition wins. We all hope for that. We are all going to work for that. What do you expect from us? You expect many months of deliberations and thinking, like in Brussels, considering scenarios. Or do you expect us to be effective, uh, to quickly reach understanding? 
what the government is going to do. And here the third part is fully in agreement with the left. Before the elections, we must know what we want to do. And not like in Germany that we win the elections and then spend three months negotiating the coalition agreement. There is no time for that. And we've been talking about it for six months, 18 months, and we were ignored uh, because we were a nuisance. But we have to use the huge history of NGOs. We have recently received uh, the book. We have a lot of material, but we have to select our tasks for the first 100 days and a task for the entire term. So the last uh, word, um, once the dust settles after the Sunday march, let's hope there are as many people as possible, we should sit down and talk very specifically about what should be done and we should agree upon it in our minimum. We must agree on the minimum and be ready to know what should be done in what order. There are so many priorities that we have to select from among them. Yes, Adrian Zandberg, and then we shall move to the social representatives. Well, um, in terms of polemics, in terms of panels, for example, I understand that we are talking about matters and issues from the order of values or set of values. I am personally afraid or I'm concerned about something else. It's not about, you know, the uh, democratic union. I, I actually have concerns shared, I believe, by Mr. Marchajski in terms of Polish, you know, ed the educated stratum, the intelligentsia, um, and the final representation of interests. Now, there is one other issue that I would like to mention in terms of being active, in terms of being present, and uh, with regard to whether people participate in discussion. We have actually untaught people, uh, or we have taught people that it doesn't make any sense, not over the last eight, but over the last 20 years. People have for many years felt to have been um, chased away uh, from the debate. I know that uh, Rafał Trzaskowski, for example, wants people to get, get engaged, and it is very honest. You can see that it's very honest with him. But you have to bear in mind that whatever happens is not going to happen overnight or even in one week. Now, I would like to go back to the professor's objection concerning the percentages and whether we could imagine a world with authorities more fragmented. I think that uh, the example of the last four, last eight years have proven that we are always going to be witnessing power play. Um, you have to bear in mind that things are possible regardless of uh, the distribution of power. We have to plan a specific distribution of powers uh, that would not block the inflow of, of new blood and new thought. Mm. We have also paid with crisis, for, uh, with crisis de democracy, with the, uh, with the failure to focus on uh, human issues and uh, public problems and problems of the society. I think that um, probably you do remember the Citizens' Pact for for uh, Media and Culture and Rule of Law. All these are of huge importance, but they do not alter our reality. Well, obviously, the most important thing is um, what we are going to do in the wake of today's meeting. We have very little time. Everybody knows that. At the same time, we are not. Uh, we we uh, our differences are so profound that we should not abandon them in the uh, hasty in our hasty activities, as has been very correctly shared, said. 
we should not be pouring the baby out with the bath water. We were asking question after question. What about those citizens' panels? Should we seek citizens out? Whose voice is mo- more important? The um, you know a average of our saving met in the street or the or that of the organizations? And I think that we should not differentiate. Both have their merit. We should not focus on theory. We should draw and draw on and tap on uh, everything we already know. I would like to remind you with the magnificent panel that was organized by the Shipyard Foundation. This is why we have been supported by non-governmental organizations and this is why we ought to be tapping any sources that might be at hand. I think we should also rewrite the rules of how our country functions. We all know that you can write down the most beautiful golden rules in the world and uh, those rules can be broken anyway. At last but not least, with regard to the question concerning the presence of young people here today, I think that today's debate is not a good example of whether on whether young pe- of whether young people participate. Let me give you two examples of how young people are active. We do know that this is not where the future gets resolved. Now, yes, we are discussing and debating the debating things, but I would like to remind you of the young people's climate strike. Um, one, do you remember the, the circumstances of the um, national recovery plan? We, uh, young people, filed, submitted thousands of comments. Uh, tomorrow, uh, at the uh, associ- at the Dead Statute Society, young people are going to be discussing their own problems. Yes, I love the name too. Mm. Actually, I believe that uh, some of the activities that are definitely true are simply invisible today, so I would be inclined to defend young people taking action in defense of what they believe in. I think that this is a very important voice that ought to reach the ears of our decision makers. Thank you very much for the... uh, for that for the invitation i would like to invite you guys to rejoin our works of the kind that we uh, did in terms of the uh, right for or campaign for rule of law because uh, because the lexenka that we are that we are now calling it uh, will be disastrous to uh, local governments for example once passed it will be actually a mockery a well a grim snicker from Novogrodzka street where law and justice has its premises we obviously want all that national recovery plan money to flow into poland nonetheless not under circumstances of us not having any rigid frame or or any kind of operational framework Now, on a more optimistic note, yes, we have met lovely people over the last couple of years. We have come together, we have uh, come up with uh, something of a uh, mycelium that is expanding and to, in- to include new individuals with its many branches. I think that expecting 100% rigorism and moralism in terms of political outcomes is absolutely unrealistic. I think that the politics is, uh, you know, uh, is not is exactly like the tram that will not um, bring you, that will not stop in your living room. You'll have to walk from the tram stop to your home, and this is exactly how politics works which is exactly why uh, maybe when considering politics you should be focusing on what you love rather than bashing what you hate. Uh, uh, And um, in closing, I would like everybody to encourage, I would like to encourage everybody to join the Sunday March. And obviously I would like to encourage, to invite everybody to join our 
works and I would like to encourage everyone to assume a positivistic attitude that the social side here represents. All that's left for us to do is to mold and shape our reality. Cuba. I am very happy that uh, Andrian Zandberg agreed with Michal Kowalsko. I won't reveal any secret if I tell you that uh, the um, Razem and uh, Shimon Hovnia's parties, IT people, were and are the best in terms of working on the uh, and when working on our database system. But it, uh, as it very often turns out, when you actually meet on the job, you stop having issues with one another. I have never said that we will be see eye to eye on all matters, just on some. Uh, I would simply want to reiterate that we have not yet won the elections. No, we have not yet uh, um, won them. I really love such meetings, you know, wise people coming together, Kuba Wignański and, uh, and uh, Professor uh, Matkowski and Nowotarski. But then we are going to leave and then, you know, we are going to um, have chips on our shoulders and have issues with each, with each other and with one another. And then when we lose the elections, we will have to draw uh, our conclusions. And at that point in time, I'm going to sell everything I have. I'm going to sell everything I have and go to Australia. We obviously are going to do anything we can in order for you to win those elections. Everything is measurable, everything is cal countable. Uh, if you don't want to join forces to, to, to in the elections, I don't understand that. But uh, people present here will not be able to understand that you don't want to go to, to, to form a single election list together and then you are going to put, to form a government together. We can understand it in Warsaw, but not from the small village I am originally from. Mm, obviously, we cannot, can, can, uh, we don't have to, you don't have to preach to Karolina Drescher or, 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 or Julia Knapik or, or Andrea Zandberg, but you have to go to my own a little village and you have to tell them there that Poland is the most important project of all. And you should not uh, ask them for Poland to be tolerant and beautiful and wondrous. What you ought to do is ask these people what kind of Poland they would want and adapt a little. Because regardless of the outcome, after these elections we will still have a Pol we will have a single Poland uh, and uh, with two nations, the uh, limited liability company in Poland and John Paul II Poland, and we don't want that. Well, uh, I would like to emphasize that regardless of the situation, pol politics will not disappear and politicians will not disappear. And as politicians, we will constantly be different in terms of our roles and aspirations and programs, and which is exactly as it should be. There is no single systemic mechanism that may prove um, to be a savior for us. I am not, uh, while I'm not necessarily a supporter of a single list for opposition members, I definitely believe that we ought to talk to each other rather than embark on magical thinking that we are going to end up with a single solution that will be a golden remedy for everything. We have to mobilize specific groups in order for social participation to become a fact and for it to be built long term, among others through talking to communities built around persons with disabilities or migrants or violence survivors. This is a much better as a solution rather than moving people, you know, two centimeters to the left or two centimeters to the right in a hope that the building blocks will reorganize themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all our panelists. We have been talking for more than two hours. Uh, even sitting here is really uh, tiresome. I would like to thank you for your patience. You have been with us since the morning, a rarity. I hope you have found the meeting useful. 
Marcin Święcicki will shortly summarize the meeting. I will take advantage of that as well, because I must say that my uh, mind is in something of a turmoil after all these hours and after work. And I hope that something good comes out of it. Do you promise? Please use the microphone if you want us to translate. Unfortunately, I cannot hear the speaker. I understand that the speaker is postulating that a task force be put together in terms of what we are going to do if we win the elections. We don't even know what our public debt is, and our great grand children will still be repaying it. Yes, but let us not start discussing a new subject. Law and justice's solutions are not necessarily good. We can see what our situation is. You can see how many regulations that are truly legal have been introduced. Thank you very much. That can be the subject of our next debate. Whereas now, briefly, I would like to um, uh, summarize our meeting that was truly very difficult and was multifaceted. I would like to um, tell you that everything has been rec recorded. We want, want to publish a report. It is also going to be uploaded to YouTube in order for these ideas that we discussed not to close with today. I would like to thank all our foreign guests and presenting their best practices. Deliberative, we have been exposed to deliberative uh, democracy and uh, citizens' panels and constant work with uh, citizens rather than um, casting a vote every four years. We have also been exposed to the tremendous uh, accom accomplishments of our NGOs. Given the authoritarian trends across the world, and especially in Poland for the past eight years, well, actually, the uh, civic society and NGOs have actually shouldered, shouldered the burden, organizing marches and discussions and debates. Uh, that has most certainly put a certain stop to these authoritarian trends. Uh, people have managed to uh, muster some power, muster some force. I would like to thank the civic society and NGOs for, the, uh, for them. And it turned out that it was actually quite efficient. Uh, suffice to mention Lex TVN or Lex Czarnek. We are definitely going to be keeping an eye on, it, on the upcoming elections. Moreover, the um, public mustering has also affected the European Union's and European Commission's attitude. We have proven to the EU that we care for European values. We have also been talking about whether we should be to, uh, establishing a third cha chamber or stop at, uh, cons at public hearings or consultations. We were also wondering whether uh, we need a, an act of law or should we rather hand over to organized forces such, such as companies and employers and employees and trade unions. It goes without saying that even if we win those elections, there is no going back to the pre-2015 era. This debate has also made us aware that we don't really have independent or that, 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 in, that um, putting a harness on independent media is not that easy. Moreover, we have been talking about uh, demographics that had become an uh, amazing fuel for the uh, for the ruling party because nobody was told anything about the details. Ultimately, we have our demographic and economic uh, equilibrium will suffer. We should also mention the climate policy and local governments and uh, the healthcare system. Without uh, social and public dialogue, without consultation, without an attempt at compromise, 
everything that uh, Traskovsky uh, mentioned, Mayor Traskovsky uh, mentioned, you will not be able to introduce certain solutions. Uh, suffice to mention the, you know, banning old cars from the center of Warsaw. Yes, we have to provide senior citizens with an alternative solutions. And this is something we can do uh, only in dialogue and only thanks to non-governmental organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I have all that le is left for me to do is to thank everyone who contributed to this intellectual feast. I would like to thank Colleg the Collegium Civitas who welcomed us free of charge. I would also want to thank Evolution Institute, uh, our sponsor. I would like to thank Mr. Jerry Lieberman uh, representing the uh, Institute. I would like to thank the European Movement from Brussels. Uh, rep uh, represented by Petros Fasoulas, who unfortunately had to leave us. A uh, great word of thanks to Professor Nina Vitoshek, who actually came up with the idea. And she mustered all the forces, and she mobilized the panel speakers and uh, got the resources together. Thank you very much for your optimism as well. I would also like to thank our panel speakers, our professors, both from Poland and abroad, and politicians who decided to join us here. I would like to thank uh, the, our de debaters and our moderators. Our, I would like to thank interpreters and uh, mm, uh, our technical support. And I would like to thank uh, Sofia Scheppel, who actually shouldered the entire burden of organizing the whole thing and putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you soon, and I hope that our future is